Let us pray. God of all time and space, we thank you for all the blessings in our lives, and especially we thank you for this community in which we live. We thank you for our nation, and we thank you for all of your creation. May the time we spend together be fruitful, and may this new year be a time of renewed energies used in such a way as to bring glory to you. May the spirit of unity and the spirit of compassion and the spirit of commitment sustain us through all that today and tomorrow will bring. It is in your holy and mighty name that we offer this prayer. Amen. Amen. Face the flag. I pledge pledge allegiance to the flag of the United United States States of America America, and to the republic Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. <clears throat> okay, with that, we'll go ahead and start the meeting. If Ms. Locke would call the roll call. Mr. Owl? Here. Mr. Winger? Here. Mrs. Turner? Here. Mr. Old? Here. Mayor Kramer? Here. Does the staff have any changes to the agenda? Staff has no changes. Does the council? Move for approval as submitted. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 The agenda is approved. Uh, proclamations. Who has Children's Week? I do. Uh, Jack Jackson, is he here? Jackie Jackson? Sorry. Uh, Whereas the 21st annual Children's Week celebrating parents and children will take place in Tallahassee from January 24th, 2016 to January 29th, 2016, brings thousands of parents, children, professionals, policymakers, and community leaders together to share valuable knowledge and information about children's issues across the state and in our capital city. And whereas the purpose of Children's Week is to create a shared vision of the state of Florida's commitment to its children and families and to engage in long-term process to develop and implement strategies. And whereas the Children's Week Committee has teamed up with statewide businesses and nonprofit organizations, including Early Learning Coalition of Indian River, Indian River, Martin and uh, Okeechobee counties, Camelot County Care, uh, Devereaux CBC, Guardian and and Lightham, and other local communities, to expand the the network of community involvement on a wide array of children and family issues at the local level. Now, therefore, the City Council of the City of Vero Beach, Florida, does here proclaim. January 24th through 29th, 2016, as Children's Week in the city of Vero Beach and ask the citizens of Vero Beach to take this opportunity to reaffirm their commitment to ensure that our children have a firm foundation for physical, mental, and spiritual growth. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, If I could just tell you a little bit about our organization, because I know this is the first time that we've ever had a proclamation, and I thank you very much for that. Because every time I get to uh, speak to um, local businesses and government agencies, that just highlights the importance of early education. And um, so uh, I am the CEO for the Early Learning Coalition. I've been in this position for seven years. And what we do is we get state and federal dollars. We bring $2.2 million into Indian River County alone. And we serve um, families between the zero and the 150% of the poverty level. And we help them get quality preschool. And so this will get those children ready for when they enter the school system. Um, <clears throat> We um, the uh, we get 94 percent of these dollars is from the state and federal government, but we also get a local match here in Indian River County as well. Uh, during Children's Week, um, it's a it's a kind of a neat experience because uh, at the Capitol there will be thousands of hands that will be hung from their tongue. I don't know if any of you have been up there during Children's Week. But it really, and there'll be a lot of activities throughout the week, and it really highlights the importance of early education. So I thank you very much for this proclamation, and I accept it on behalf of um, all of our counties and for the state of Florida. Yeah. Could you make sure that we, we, we know, and the, uh, and the audience know this listening, um, mm-hmm. uh, where to go and how to get involved and where, what your email address is or, or your, what the site, uh, website is? The website is uh, www.elsermo, 
which is E-L-C-I-R-M-O dot org. Um, and you can go on that website. And for every $200 we raise, uh, we can match that with state and federal dollars, and that serves a child for a year in quality Great. education, preschool education. Great. So Great. thank you for that. Thank you. Want to come up for a picture? I would. I would love to have a picture. Can I get somebody from the audience to take the camera guy? <laughs> <laughs> Looks like he didn't have an excuse. He's letting me get this very good. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks, Jack, very much. Uh, next, we'll have a proclamation for Carl Zimmerman Day. Wonderful. Mr. Turner? It is my distinct honor today to read this proclamation. Mr. Carl Zimmerman has served the Vero Beach Tree Commission for over 30 years. In 2003, the name of the Tree Commission was changed to the Tree and Beautification Commission in order to give the commission more ways to beautify the city with more than just trees. His dedication to the beauty of Vero Beach can be seen throughout our city. In the earlier years, he was part of the annual tree seedling sales and taught local children how to grow their own seedlings. He was part of the city being recognized as Tree City USA. He took part in the annual Arbor Day tree plantings, the tree dedication program, and the Tree Commission's latest project, the hanging planters in our own Barrow Beach downtown. As you drive around our beautiful city, you will see the tremendous influence Mr. Zimmerman had in making our city what it is today. It is with great appreciation that we give Mr. Zimmerman this award for his outstanding dedication to our city and pronounce January 5th as Carl Zimmerman Day. Well, thank you very much. Uh, <laughs> Mr. Mayor, uh, members of City Council, um, does that mean I get a get out of jail free card today? <laughs> We've got the chief got there. The chief. Oh, I, I noticed he was there. I shook his hand when I came in just to enhance that. Or, or Jim, does that mean I get a discount on my utility bill? Uh, yes, sir. No, the answer. It's the same discount we all get. Yes. Okay, good. We'll leave that. Uh, I, I just want to thank you for that. Uh, it's been an interesting and rewarding 30 years. I've had an opportunity to serve with a lot of great people who were dedicated. Uh, a lot of those former mayors whose picture are on the wall there were friends and, uh, and confidants and supporters of what the Tree Commission uh, is about relative to the city of Vero Beach, which is really enhancing, protecting, and educating about the tree canopy. And that's one of the things that I've really enjoyed. Many of you don't know, but one of my prior careers was in the landscape contracting business. And uh, I had the opportunity to plant uh, all the trees in the Riverside Park uh, parking lot across from Riverside Theater. And uh, that is an interesting story because after I got the contract, I found out that that area had been the stump dump for the city of Vero Beach. So we ended up extracting as many tree stumps as we planted trees during that project. You also probably don't know that uh, the uh, city hall, uh, excuse me, the police department headquarters was a project that my landscape company had the opportunity to plant. So there are a lot of trees around the city and county that I've had some influence in uh, getting planted and uh, selecting the type trees that were planted. So I really appreciate that. I want to thank you for the proclamation and uh, assure you that the current tree commission 
uh, is being well serviced and uh, will continue to do an even better job than they did during my period of time. Thank you. Thank you so much for sharing all your talents with us, Carl. Mr. Zimmerman. Oh, I get to take it with me, too. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, go plant a tree in your honor. Thank you so much for Thanks keeping so our much. city so Thank beautiful, you. Carl. Thank you. Jay? Great legacy. Thanks. Thank you very much. Thank yeah. you, Carl. Congratulations. Yeah. Thank you. Here. You take the Carl? Jim? I'm sure we'll see you. Thank you. Next, I've got a plaque for a, uh, a former mayor who, uh, all I can say is, is exercised a, a, an immense amount of uh, patience and uh, perspired through two years of service. Uh, I can tell you, because being a mayor, it's actually very, very tiresome, and uh, to, uh, to actually do it two years back to back is, uh, is quite amazing. But uh, we have a, a plaque for a, uh, a grateful appreciation for uh, Mr. Uh, Richard Winger. Well, thank you. Can somebody take a picture of this? Um, we have a photographer. <laughs> <laughs> if you can send me the pictures, that would be great. We don't mean to take advantage of you, but <laughs> today seems to be your day. Thanks. <laughs> there's a, there's a so fee, right? right <laughs> All right. Here, let's get a little closer. Okay. One, two, and three. All right. Great. Thank, Thank you very so much. much. Okay. Jay, uh, thank you very much. I was just counting the mayors on the wall. There have been 48 mayors. Of course, several have served more than once, and some of the early ones served quite a long time. It might interest the public to know that only uh, two people have served back-to-back -back terms since the 1960s, and after having done it at my age, I can tell you why. It's exhausting. So good luck as mayor. Uh, I'm glad you're doing it, and it's been my pleasure to serve the people of Vero Beach, and I look at it as trying to serve them to the best of my ability, and I hope it was successful. Thank you for the award. Thank you. Next, we're going to go on to uh, the public comment. If, uh, if there's anybody in the audience that would like to speak, if you could come over to the, to the podium one at a time. I'm Herb Whittall, 19 Park Avenue in the city, and uh, I'm sorry I'm so casual, but I just came from my dermatologist, <laughs> and he cut something <laughs> off my leg, so I'm glad I'm in shorts. Anyway, uh, I see that you've got on your agenda the uh, stormwater treatment discussion of stormwater utility. And some people say this is an extra tax, and I agree it is. It's a way to raise money. but. To me, it's a much more equitable way of raising the money to take care of the pollution that the city dumps into the lagoon. Everybody is for cleaning up the lagoon, and the only way to do it, unfortunately, is to spend money. But uh, the other way of doing it, you took $100,000 out of your budget for this year for doing some stormwater work because we were going to have this stormwater uh, utility. And the stormwater utility will tax a lot of people that don't get taxed on real estate. And they are still people that dump water into the lagoon from the city. So to me, this is a much more equitable way of doing it than having the city put it into their regular budget. It's uh, something that I think needs to be done. And as a citizen, I'm going to pay for it. But I think I'll pay less for it than if you put it into the budget. So I'd like to just say, let's do it. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Hetty. Hello, council members. Morning. Chris, right? Not Kringle, though. <laughs> you might know my my brother Brian. Anyway, the uh, Mr. Mr. Zimmerman talked about 
a get out of jail card. And uh, to the best of my knowledge, the only ones that ever needed to get out of jail card were me and Frank Zork. I think we're the only two that have ever been arrested for daring to come to this public podium and express our point of view. And uh, I know Frank uh, went to jail for, uh, and uh, they uh, wound up paying Frank a lot of money for that. But uh, anyway, it's cold outside. I have my sweater. I've got my hat on. i got to keep warm. And uh, thank goodness for the cold because it brings the snowbirds down here. People are belly aching about the traffic. I love the traffic. I love the snowbirds. Come on down. Stay a long time. Bring money. Right? Bring lots of money. Anyway, uh, a couple of meetings ago, I was here and... I asked you whether you had read a book that was in wide circulation in town. You said you read parts of it. And uh, anyway, I would hope that you've had time to read the rest. And uh, to give you a really short, in April of 2008, there was a contract for between OUC and the city of Vero Beach on the electric. And uh, <coughs> the uh, I think Mr. Whittle may have been on the... Uh, on the uh, committee at the time that reviewed the committee, or reviewed the contract before they approved it. And the contract was delivered to those council, or to those uh, commission members the night before they voted on it. This is a billion dollar contract. It was delivered the night before they voted on it by uniformed police officers. And it was redacted. They didn't see the numbers. In uh, conversations with city council members uh, after the fact, you got a couple of different points of view that it wasn't redacted when they looked at it. But in any event, redacted or not, when they voted for the contract, they came before the, the uh, consultants and OUC came before the council and they talked about what the contract was, what it said, and uh, it was going to give us FP&L rates, even lower maybe at some time in the future. You fast forward to the fall of 09 and un the contract was finally released to the public. And it was finally released to the public in an unredacted version of it. And uh, at that point, there were some mistakes or some changes that were made. Charlie Wilson was running for office, and that troublemaker Brian Hetty was running for office. And in fact, they both got elected. And when they got elected, the unredacted contract raised lots of questions and lots of controversy because it seems that the numbers were changed. The city attorney and the consultant appeared before the council and testified under oath. We were assured, the city council members at the time, were assured that the only changes to the contract were the numbers, <laughs> the rates that we're going to pay. You know, other than the amount of money that you're going to have to pay, everything else is the same, except that we're not going to give you the low rates we promised. We're going to give you higher rates. In fact, we're going to not only give you not going to give you equal to FPL, but we're in fact going to give you 20, 30 percent higher. And uh, <clears throat> the city attorney at the time tried to have the council members retroactively approve those changes, and the council wouldn't do it. No council member at that time would approve the changes to the contract. And I would argue that as a matter of law, if you change the contract, you don't have one. One party can't change it unilaterally. It takes an agreement between the parties. No one would approve it until the uh, last council in the fall of 2015, right? And they retroactively approved the changes. It's an interesting concept. They're going to go back and approve something that no one would approve over the course of five years, they're going to go back and approve it. And uh, that's going to solve the fight, I guess. I don't think it solved anything. You know, and there's an interesting concept, an interesting point of law, and uh, it's in the Constitution called ex post facto after the fact. 
So you can't, you can't enact a law after an event happened and then go back and arrest somebody for doing something for a law that was passed after the event. And uh, I would argue that same kind of principle would apply here that the council can't go back and approve a fraud that happened a lot of years ago. Anyway, in the fall of uh, 2015, that council retroactively approved that and the OUC contract continues to date and uh, we continue to pay higher rates. I ask you whether you uh, had read uh, the book Liars, Cheats, and Thieves because it explained except for the 2015 event, it explained a lot of this. And you can go back and you can look in the public record and see that the facts that were presented in that book are in fact factual. And uh, I think Pilar Turner, Council Member Turner was quoted in the paper saying, yeah, I got the facts right. And uh, I think that uh, the current mayor, Mr. Kramer, um, was quoted similar. That, uh, yeah, the facts are there. <coughs> anyway, I asked you, because you're a new council member, mm -hmm. whether or not you read the book and whether or not um, you had any thoughts on it. You said you were going to go back and read it, and I hope you did. The reason I come here before you today is to ask you, number one, did you go back and read it? And if you did, and even if you didn't, you ran a campaign on fixing the electric issue, and I certainly believed you during the course of your campaign, but I've believed other people during the course of a campaign only to find out that they were full of donkey dust. That's okay, right, Mr. Mayor? That's Don fine. Donkey dust. We, it's we, the same as the other stuff, but... We get your, your meaning. Yeah. Anyway. <laughs> so... Uh, Anyway, the, uh, the deal now is, can you do something for us? And you can. And what you can do is you can turn over the keys to FPNL. Start tomorrow morning. And I have not read the entirety of your book. Okay, well, today. I just gave you a synopsis, and, it's a, and, and it, it pretty well outlined up. Well, I just pretty well outlined what happened. So there was a contract that nobody ever approved that gave us rates that no one ever approved that were much different than the rates that we were promised. And we're currently in that same, that same situation. That's right. And it would be nice if you gave us a late Christmas present us and the county and the Indian River Shores that are within the Vero Beach City Electric give us a Christmas present and say, okay, council, let's turn this over to FPNL. And if I could snap my fingers and make that happen. No, all you have to do is make a motion. See whether or not you can get a second. Turn the keys over to FPNL. It's really not that hard. It's really not that difficult to do. I don't think that's feasible at this time, Mr. Pardon? I don't believe that that's feasible option Why? this time. It, well, first of all, I haven't seen said keys, okay? And second, uh, well, the, we don't. Yeah, that's, I mean, you, you know exactly what I mean. And you, you spoke to contracts a moment ago. You have to have agreement in contracts. And so we're, we're working toward, I, at least my hope is that we're going to be able to make something happen. FPNL has agreed to, to buy it, and we've agreed to sell it. So we've got two willing parties. Just give FPNL the keys. Let them take over. I don't believe we've agreed to sell it to date. No. This is public comment. Well, we agreed. Allow them just to continue on. You don't have to. Okay. Well, that's we, we, did, we did agree to sell it, and there was a contract that was signed. I, re I recall. And if we gave the keys to FPNL, you know, and, and someone talked to me recently and said how difficult it was. And said, well, it's not difficult at all. It's really a computer thing. It's really got nothing to do with the electric. All right? The bills all go out. It's all computerized. <coughs> okay, FPNL, here's the keys. You take over your computer. It's all programmed in already. The territories are all segregated out because there's different taxes on them. And here you go, FPNL. You're in charge. Charge us FPNL rates. Done deal. 
And if it can't be done, I'm all ears, why can't you do it? If the council members said, okay, we've had enough of this fraud. Mr. Mayor, I raised the point of order. Well, I'm, it's I'm, out of order for a citizen to direct questions, particularly to one member and particularly in All right, then I'll address it to the whole council. Is there any the reason why? That I've got a council member that's directly engaging. But, you know, and if, if you want, I mean, this is something you can think about and possibly bring back as an agenda item. Maybe that's a better thing to do is, is to leave that, and you can talk with Brian in private and see well, if there's enough information there to bring it back. There's nothing, there's nothing private about this, Mr. Mayor, um, and thank you for your considerations. There's nothing private about this. This is, a, this is a very public utility, and it's a very public debate, and there's, if there's a reason why we can't tell FPNL, okay, we've had enough, the taxpayers and the ratepayers have had enough. Here's the key is, if there's a reason why you can't do that, I'm all ears, and this is going to be broadcast, so taxpayers are probably all ears, too. Why not? Because you have a new council member that has not digested all of the information that has happened in the past, and you're asking them to make a spot decision. That's not fair. Okay. But I do think so, you make some good points. But I'm not, I'm not being correct. fair, I, I, but, you know, here's what's not fair. What's not fair is what's happened to the taxpayers over the years. We have the ability, and you have the ability as a council member, to say, okay, enough is enough. Indian River Shores, we're selling your portion of the uh, electric utility to FP&L. They could take over. Tomorrow morning, Indian River Shores would have FP&L rates. Indian River County... We're doing the same thing. We're giving your portion of the electric utility, we're not giving, selling to FP&L. You'll get FP&L rates starting whatever, whatever your motion says. You can make it February 1st if you want. You can make it tomorrow morning as far as I'm concerned. And they'll get FP&L rates. FP&L will then own the Indian River Shores territory and the county territory, and that ends two lawsuits immediately. Why couldn't you do that? Or any other council member that would like to answer that question. Why couldn't you do that? It's a good question. All good points. Okay. Which I don't think I'm prepared to answer. Okay. So, so all you need to do is make a motion that we finally divest ourselves of the Indian River Shores territory and the county territory. FP&L, come on in. It's yours. It's a computer change. FP&L then takes over and runs their, uh, their territory and charges them FP&L rates. And FP&L can pay the city of Vero Beach for those two territories. And you know, you could make it real easy for FP&L. Tell them no money down. And they can start, pay, pay us over the next 20 years. And we know what the territories are worth because we agreed to the $179 million. We know the portion, roughly, Indian River Shores is what, 10%, the county's 50%, whatever the numbers are. That's, that's an easy calculation. So if Indian River Shores is 10% of $179 million, $18 million, FP&L, you can pay us over the next 20 years. That's income for the city. You have all these meetings about what you're going to do with the, with the uh, utility site to generate income. Here's some income for you. And not only do you get the income, but you end the lawsuit. Finance the whole thing. I don't care if you don't charge them any interest. Charge them low interest, FPNL. We know what the number is. And we do the same thing with the county. And all it takes is a motion by a council member to do that and a majority vote. Now, you probably won't get a majority vote because there are people on the council who have claimed for years that, oh, they wanted to see the utility sold, but that's not at all what they were looking for because they didn't tell us the truth. Because often politicians lie, cheat, and steal from us. You know? They tell us one thing, and then when they get in the office, they do something different. 
And that's what I'm hoping is that you're different. And you can be different by saying, you know what? It's time to end this nonsense. It's time to end the lawsuit. We're going to end Indian River, law, Indian River Shores lawsuit. We're going to sell that portion to FPNL. Indian River Shores is happy. You generate that $17 million income over 20 years, or whatever it is, a million dollars a year income to the city. Do the same thing for the county. We already have those territories segregated out in the computer. So we know how much each one of those customers is using. We know who they are. FP&L will then take over the maintenance of the uh, infrastructure. FP&L would then own the infrastructure in those areas. And if there's a reason, again, I'm all ears. And you should be all ears. If there's a reason Mr. why you Mayor, can't do I, that. Mr. Mayor, I raised the point of order. He's again addressing he, the he's starting to badger specifically, and he's gone I'm over not, the boundary. Mr. Am I badgering you, sir? I just, I, I, I tell you, I think that uh, we're getting into a lot of issues right now that you're making good points, Mr. Hetty, but I don't think that today is the time or the place to that's ask, been me, the, ask me to make well, that this kind is, of a This right. is a really good agenda item. And that's perhaps, been the problem. Perhaps it should be brought back as an agenda item if it's, and I have, if I'm it's something you wish to do. That. Okay. All right. Bring it back on the next agenda. Can you do that? I believe I, I believe that we can. Okay. So I'll be back to the next meeting. What's that, two weeks from today? You, any of us can do that. So, I mean, you can talk to any of us about that. But Well, all of you can hear me. I'm not, you know, unless you're sleeping, you all can hear me. But, uh, you know, you can bring that back as an agenda item. Somebody explain to us out loud, not privately, not talk to them after the meeting, none of that stuff. Well, out loud, publicly. So the public can hear why they're getting screwed royally. So the public can understand why this fraud is allowed to continue. Put it on the agenda. I mean, it, that's not a difficult thing to do, and that's not, that's not asking you a whole lot. All I'm asking you to do is be honest with the public and do what you said you were going to do when you ran for office and, you. and take care of this issue. So... If you could put it on the next agenda, you don't want to answer questions. And, uh, and, and I, I understand, and I'm not criticizing you for not having the answers, but here's my criticism of you right now. Let's not go there. Is that there are Mr. legitimate questions. Mr. Hedy, are you purposely if, trying to, to, to be a headache? I mean, I'm, just, I, I'm, I'm sorry. I just got to frankly ask that question. You're, you've repeated yourself. This is the fourth time now. This is not the fourth time. This has gone over and over about putting it on the council agenda. I mean, the council okay. member has the opportunity. Okay, and, and we've already gone there. And what, what should concern you right now is that if there are answers to these very good questions, you don't hear anyone saying, hey, council member Howell, here's why this can't be done. No one's saying that to you. And you would think that if there were good reasons why they couldn't do it, They'd be standing up and screaming, council member, councilman, here's why we can't do that. Nobody's saying that to you. Thank you. Because it's just a continuation of the fraud. I understand. You made a lot of good points and, and points to take into consideration. I appreciate it, Mr. Hetty. Is there anybody else that would like to do? Ms. Ms. Moss? Good morning, Laura Moss, Utilities Commission member at large. Happy New Year to Happy all. Happy New Year. Um, I just have a couple of, I think, pretty straightforward procedural questions. Uh, the first would be regarding the stormwater utility, um, and I'm only asking it now. I'm very interested to hear what the discussion regarding it will be today, but since public comment comes first, um, I'll just ask, it's my understanding that a consultant has been retained, is that, um, and this, I guess, is for Mr. O'Connor, the question. Um, is that correct? Yes, ma'am. We have a contract that is in place now to study the outline and design of a stormwater utility. Well, Will that come to the Utilities Commission yes, to be vetted? It and what is there a, a timeline for that at this point? Yes, there is. We do have a timeline that has been set. They're in the process of data gathering now. Uh, 
the way the timeline is, and not to be held steadfastly to this, but uh, they are in the first phase, the task one that is outlined in the contract, which is the preliminary report. Then they're going to have the utility rate structure uh, type, the cost per partial. Then they go to task three, which is utility billing method alternatives. Uh, and then it goes to community outreach, reach out to the community. Then task five is when they come back and mm -hmm. talk to utility commission, finance commission, as well as the city council mm -hmm. and a presentation and design of an ordinance of how you would go about doing the utility, uh, stormwater utility. The date that we anticipate this occurring is between May and June would be the last presentation to the council. In between would be the tasks that they would be performing. So they would be coming to the Utilities Commission around what period of time? Probably in May is in what May. we anticipate. Oh, I see. Uh, Mr. Mayor, can I comment in, in answer to Ms. Moss' question? I feel very strongly that this is one of those things that takes a 90-day or more uh, vetting by finance, utilities, mm -hmm. interested parties in the community, and so on. It's one of those things that uh, should really be thought about one way or another and the consequences of it. So I think your question is appropriate and, and Jim's answer is appropriate. Mm -hmm. We've expended roughly half of the money so far and the contract is the contract. So I think what will happen is the contract will come back and then there'll be a long discussion of what we should do. But I think the contract and the finishing of it are inviolate. What you asked for, you certainly must have more than one crack on mm -hmm. the Utilities Commission of saying, is this good, bad, should it be done, should it not be done, how it should be done if it is done? Mm -hmm. Thank yes. you for your chance to comment. Ms. Moss? Yeah, uh, yes, I, I, I agree with that. I think we need to thoroughly review it. and uh, that's, I'm looking forward to hearing the discussion today as well as the, uh, the report from the consultant and then fully vetting it within the, the commissions. Uh, my other question I think is also procedural is... Uh, I think it's on the agenda today, the electric uh, utility impact fees. Um, did that, should that, would that be under the purview of the Utilities Commission? Um, I mean, I, I, I'm, I'm not clear really on what is what will happen with it today. Are you going to be voting on it today? or? Yeah, yes, ma'am. Um, I'll be looking for direction from the City Council. We have uh, several developments are starting to take place, and we need to get direction from the council if an impact fee is really warranted. It is my recommendation to the city council that we do away with the impact fee and the electric utility. Mm -hmm. Mr. Mayor, yeah. again, again, a comment. I think that's got to go to utilities before it comes to We're us. We're going to have it as an yeah. a item later on. Um. I'm sorry. So it's not going to be voted on today. I was just—I was just a little surprised to see it when I checked the agenda because I thought, gee, I—I I didn't remember having discussed we're, we're, that within you, within the commission. The, um, what we're doing is looking for consensus to start the process. Oh, yes, I see. The consensus. I see. Okay. Because okay. I don't want to impose an impact fee that tomorrow we change our mind on. So that's yeah. the direction of the council. Okay. Thank you for clarifying. Appreciate it. Good questions, Mr. Gifanti. Good morning, my name is Joseph Grafanti, and I pay taxes to the city of Vero Beach. The last time I was here, I mentioned how there was a lack of communication to and from the city clerk who was responsible for all the correspondence that goes in and out of the city of Vero Beach. And I was told, and I didn't like the way it was working, and finally, I got, after all these years, somebody to admit that that's the way we do things. And that's exactly what the uh, city attorney said. That's the way we do things. Now, that's something that I've surmised for years. Let me translate that to for the people who don't really know what's going on. That's the way we do things. That means that... We gather in smoke-free backroom closets and conduct the city's business and then come out here and make a prison. I'm talking about your staff. Come out here and you guys vote on it and it's predetermined. We all know how you're pretty much how most of you are going to go. And by the way, I'm not singling out the city attorney. He, uh, I, that's the way you do business throughout your whole system. 
here on this floor and upstairs. Something that I've known or surmised for years, and now if one of you finally admit it, that that's the way you do business. And by the way, as I said, I'm not singling out the city uh, attorney. Uh, none of you, uh, well, any comments that I make are specifically designed to address your activity as a, on the payroll of the city of Vero Beach. On a personal level, and I've never told this to old, I hope he doesn't fall asleep, and the new guy, uh, Harry, um, I know him as Harry, sorry, um, that uh, none of you on a personal level need anything more to me, as I said, on a personal level, than a man on the moon, or a woman, as the case may very well be. So anything I say is directed at your activity as an employee of the city of Vero Beach. So... And don't so I don't want to be, ever be accused of making a personal attack, because I'll in, construe that as a violation of my of my right to address uh, a grievance. And the second thing this morning, so I appreciate the city attorney who for coming clean, so that everybody knows what's going on. And something I haven't addressed in a long time was the traffic lights in the city of Vero Beach. And the other day, I was going south during rush hour, and there's no rush hour in Vero Beach, but you know what I mean, uh, compared to where I came from anyway. Uh, I was traveling south on Indian River Boulevard, and I'm sure some of you have been on there. And the light was red, and I stopped, and there were a couple cars in front of me, and the light turned green, The uh, and the... No one was in going south now. <clears throat> excuse me. No one was in the left-hand turning lane to go out to Royal Palm Point. No one was there. Yet the cars going north were stopped, and they couldn't proceed. Okay, they couldn't go because this arrow was there where, and there was no car. There wasn't a possum or a raccoon or a snail or a salamander or whatever, one of those little baby dinosaurs, chameleons or whatever they're called. Nobody was there. And then I proceeded to count as I went past these cars going north. Uh, there was about over 50 cars that were stopped at that light that were prevented from moving forward. Now the good news is, and you're not going to like this, or I don't care if you like it or not, the moron in charge of setting the lights in the city of Vero Beach is leaving the county. Well, that's the good news. Now why do I say refer to him as a moron? Because I called Joe Baird, you know, the barstool guy, and I asked him, left a message on his machine, I would like you, Mr. Baird, to meet me at such and such a corner intersection and stand there for five minutes and watch this light and tell me why I shouldn't think that the person that set this light, the timing, etc., isn't a moron. And he never responded justifiably so. And so, bottom line is, that's why I can refer to the guy that's leaving. Who is in charge? He's a traffic, so-called engineer, who is in charge of the lights in the city of Vero Beach. So there's hope for the new year that maybe somebody will do something about the traffic lights. Most of the traffic in Vero Beach is created by the traffic lights and not the number of people. I will say this to justify that. You double the time it takes from one place to the other, you double the amount of traffic. Think about that one. Have a nice day. Uh, Mr. Fonte, I, I, I really take personally your remarks, and I, don't, I really don't think they're, they're a call for at all. The idea of us working in smoke-filled rooms in the back is just absolutely absurd. And the idea that we admit to it or say, yes, yes, that's the fact, is not, not correct at all. Are you it speaking is, for I, your... I take that very personally. I've been on a lot of, in a lot of situations where, where maybe it's questionable, not, not in this particular location, but in others. This is really run well, and there is no collusion in the back room by any stretch of the imagination. And for you to imply that or say we've proved it is absolutely absurd. 
Absolutely well, I, absurd. I can speak and understand the English language very well. Good. Not speak it, but I understand it. I'm a better writer than I'm a speaker. I heard what the city attorney said. I don't want to draw him into this discussion. I heard I heard what he said. That's the way we do business. And I take offense at that. And I've taken offense at that for years because that's exactly the way. And you're not going to blow smoke in my direction. He said, he said, you don't see, not every single amendment is, is made public. We, we amend documents often and often, and not every single one is made public. That's what he was saying. He said that's the way we that, do that's business, we, that's the way and we that's, do that's business. the way I don't want yeah. the business to be done. I want Sorry. the information to be forthcoming. When you have a billion-dollar contract sitting on his desk, for, and I'm not – this is an example – a billion-dollar contract sitting on somebody's desk, and it's kept away from the public and the it, press. It was not that kept is, away from yes, the press. Yes, it was. It wasn't no, revealed. No, it was not. Guys, Sir, guys, no. it hold, wasn't hold revealed. I'm sorry. Yeah. Because that's the way you do business. It wasn't revealed. Don't try to blow smoke in my face. you got the wrong guy. Have a good day. Thank you. Is there anybody else that would like public comment? Seeing none, I'll close public comment. Uh, we'll move on to the consent agenda. Um, is there anybody that, in the public that would like to speak on any of the matters of the consent agenda? If not, is there anybody of the uh, council that would like to pull, them up, pull an item? Move for approval. I'll second. All in favor? Aye. 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 <laughs> okay. Move on to public hearings. We've got quasi-judicial. I don't ex- expect there to be a lot of uh, argument on this, but... Uh, Doggone it says the mayor's got to read the title, so I'm going to see if I can if I can do this. It'll say an ordinance of the city of Vero Beach, Florida, requested by 1745 State Road 60 LLC to amend the comprehensive plan future land use map by changing the future land use designation from commercial, which is 15 to 18 units per acre, to mixed use, which is 17 to 18 units per acre, for property located at 1745 20th Street in the original town of Vero, now the city of Vero Beach totaling 0.34 of an anchor, acre, <clears throat> excuse me, more or less, and providing for an effective date. Um, is this a first reading or a second? Um, Mayor, you can read, this is the final public hearing, and you can read the second ordinance if you'd like. Both ordinances can be read together, just um, a motion needs to be separate for both of them. All right. An ordinance of the City of Vero Beach, Florida, requested by 1745 State Road 60 LLC, amending the official zoning map by changing the zoning designation of C1B General Commercial Trades and Services District to DTW Downtown District for property located at 1745 20th Street in the original town of Vero, now the City of Vero Beach Corporation, totaling 0.34 of an acre, more or less, provided for an effective date. Um, is there, is there anybody here that, uh, that plans on uh, speaking on this issue at all? If so, we've got, to get, uh, we've got to get people sworn in. Is there any member of the council that has any ex parte communications or has visited the site? No, okay. Ms. Fox, you want to swear them in? Sure. Please raise your right hand. Do you solemnly swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so help you God? I do. I, do. I have gone to look at the site. Okay. Uh, Mr. McGarry, you are uh, first up for your presentation. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, 1745 State Route 60 LLC is requesting to amend the future land use map from commercial to mixed use and zoning from C1B to downtown for a property of about a third of an acre located at 1745 20th Street, which is on State, State Route 60. Uh, I'll briefly summarize the major facts and findings from the staff report that was given to the Planning and Zoning Board. Um, Going over the existing conditions, currently the property is vacant, directly abutting the subject property to the east, our offices designated mixed use uh, on the future land use map and zone downtown. Across State Route 60, 20th Street is a church designated commercial uh, on the future land use map and C1B. Across the alley to the south is vacant with future land use designation of residential medium and the zoning designation of POI, professional office uh, institutional. To directly to the west is a commercial retail use which is designated uh, commercial on the future land use map and C1B in the zoning. Uh, 
The property has access to full complement of city utilities. Day Route 60, which fronts the property, is a multi-lane divided facility classified as an urban principal arterial. The 2014 average daily traffic was approximately 20,000 vehicles per day. Uh, one of the things we do when we're looking at changes in designations is compare the, the existing uses allowed versus the ones that could happen in that uh, new designation. The staff report does provide a detailed comparison. However, I'll just summarize what I feel are the major differences between uh, commercial and mixed use future land use designations. Both these designations are suitable for urban scale development, which is which is what we're talking about in this area. However, the mixed use designation is for areas of the central core of the city. That's why the downtown is a mixed use designation. Um, the FAR in the commercial uh, designation <coughs> is limited to one, while in the downtown or the mixed use, it's 2.0. The commercial designation allows 15 dwelling units per acre, 18 for efficiencies, while the mixed use allows 17 dwelling units per acre. Both uh, allow 30 motel or hotel units per acre. Zonings where there are major differences in this. Both the C1B and downtown allow similar commercial uses. The major difference is the downtown allows both residential and transit residential motel hotel uses. Uh, no hotel or residential uses are allowed in the C1B. Other differences are the FAR which, uh, of uh, the C1B, which is 0 0.5, uh, while the downtown is a maximum 2.0. Open space is 25% in the C1B, downtown is 10%. The height in the C1B is limited to 35 feet, while it's 50 feet in the downtown district. And the parking requirements are more lenient in the downtown. However, one thing is all off-street parkings are required generally to be behind the buildings, so the buildings are put up front on the, on the road. Uh, the staff did a review and analysis in accordance with the provisions of Chapter 65, Article 3 of the City's Land Development Regulations. The staff found that the proposed amendments meet the review standards of Section 6522I. I'll briefly just go over the significant findings in the staff report. Um, the staff did find that the amendments are warranted just to provide, provide for the continuation of the downtown district. The requested future land use change is consistent with the policies of the comp plan. Primary land use element policy 1.9 has a property abuts existing mixed use designated property and will allow further logical expansion of the downtown. The requested zoning was found consistent with the comprehensive plan policies and is consistent with expanding the logical progression of uh, downtown zoning for the mixed use and infill development. The proposed zoning is compatible with the zoning detonation in the immediate vicinity. Property abutting on the east is zoned downtown already. Remaining properties are all zoned non-residential. The POI zoning in the south will provide a transition between this property and residentially zoned uh, properties in the Edgewood neighborhood to, direct to the south. The level of service for all the utilities and servers is sufficient capacity to serve the development. The traffic analysis shows that the PM peak hour traffic may even be less than associated with strip commercial development, which could occur at that location under the C1B uh, designation. Uh, a traffic study is not required as part of the site. It will be required as part of the site plan approval. So that's when we get into more detail of what's going to trans uh, uh, be proposed for the site. Therefore, based on these findings, the staff report, the staff and the Planning and Zoning Board recommended approval both ordinances for favorable consideration by the City Council. Uh, before you maybe want to open it up, I don't know if the applicant would like to make a few words. Uh, certainly you can ask me questions or bring the applicant up to ask some questions. Yeah, this would be the to time you. to ask questions on his presentation if you'd like. Do you, do you need the applicant? Is that what you're asking? Well, for, he sir? has the right to, to question your, your presentation. Uh, I don't you want to question? No, Go ahead. <laughs> okay, well, um, I think that's not. There's not a problem. Let me, let there. me give the council an opportunity. If to you ask want questions. to ask any questions, none here. Okay. If that's not, if if you'd like to make a statement or a presentation, now would be the time. Thank you, and I'll keep it very brief. My name is Joseph Schulke, Schulke on Slaughter, Rear Beach, Florida. I'm here representing 1745 State Route 60 LLC. Uh, we work with staff since, uh, I think, April uh, on this project. Uh, it's a very exciting project. Um, we found that the, the downtown area is, is, is becoming a more vibrant area. There's a lot more interest 
and the downtown zoning district facilitates what we think are better development guidelines, pushing the building to the street as opposed to having a strip center. That's the main one of the main advantages of the city, I would say, uh, as well as uh, as Tim had mentioned in uh, his report. Really, um, the downtown district, what we're doing here is probably more consistent with the comp plan than the current C1B zoning is there. Um, one of the main things the comp plan says is they want to discourage strip development or along State Road 60 out to about 20th Avenue. Um, this will do exactly that. You can't really do a strip center when you have to have the building in the front and the parking in the back. Um, it, it would be exciting to see something go up in this property and, and, and continue uh, uh, with the re revitalization of the downtown area. Other than that, um, I'm happy to answer any questions you have, and uh, I want to thank Tim for his efforts. And, uh, oh, and by the way, I, I also want to mention, should have, before I started, uh, but Happy New Year to everybody. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Does any council have any questions? Or? I have none. Okay. Um, I'm kind of sensing here that we don't have really have an argument or a need for rebuttal. I is think that you need to open it up for the public hearing. But is that, am I correct on that? We're not. No. We're in. Okay. Does the public have any? Uh, would like to say anything regarding this? If there is no none of the public uh, testimony to be given, and there's no argument between uh, the parties here. Uh, does council have any discussion amongst themselves as to what we should do here or a motion? I I could present a motion. Yeah, okay. and remember, we need a separate motion for each ordinance. Right, a separate, and B. separate motion, separate vote. Do the first one A, which would be for the future land use designation. Okay. Well, I move that based on the competent substantial evidence presented and the applicable co provisions that we grant the application uh, for and adopt the ordinance, or, ordinance as proposed for item A, land use. Is, can I can I couple that with B, or do I have to also state? We've got to do it separately. Separate. Separate. Okay. Then I guess we have to take a vote. I'll on. second. Okay. Ms. Falk, would you call the roll? Mr. Howell? Yes. Mr. Winger? Yes. Mrs. Turner? Yes. Mr. Old? Yes. Mayor Kramer? Yes. Do I have a motion for the second one? Sure, I'll do it. Done. <laughs> well, no, we do. we've got the we got the language we're going to. Okay. Um, someone tell me what the language right, should right be. Here. Right here. Okay. Uh, I move that based on the competent substantial evidence presented and the applicable code provisions, we right here, grant, the, uh, grant the application for, um, for, for, I don't know, what, what is it, uh, 4B? Uh, grant the application, the, um, someone help me here. Be amending the zoning map uh, from C1B to DTW. Correct, okay. Tim. Thank you. Do I have a second? I'll second it. Okay. Uh, Ms. Fock, would you call the roll? Mr. Howell? Yes. Mr. Winger? Yes. Mrs. Turner? Yes. Mr. Old? Yes. Mayor Kramer? Yes. Uh, we're going to move on to legislative hearings, which is 4C. Um, Tim, thank you. Before we get too far, this is, uh, I believe this, uh, this is a rezoning for the firing range. Is that correct? It's a permitted use for the firing Pretty range. Uh, it has recently been found that the firing range did not fit in with our codes, even though it's been in use for many years. Okay. So we're doing a correction. Okay. Mr. McGarry, would you fill us in on this? Um, I need, to, need read to read the read title read first, directly. Mayor. Yeah. Okay. A resolution of the City Council of Vero Beach, Florida, approving the transmittal to the State of Florida Department of Economic Opportunity of a proposed ordinance amending the future land use map of the Vero Beach Comprehensive Plan, providing for conflict and severability, providing for an effective date, requested by the Planning and Development Director. Oh, thank you. Um, uh, this uh, request is being uh, done on behalf of the Police Department. Uh, they're requesting that we... Uh, Propose a land use change or approve a land use, a future land use change would change for conservation CV to uh, industrial for the 10 and a half acre city owned property located at 4401 uh, Street. This property is used currently as a law enforcement pistol training center. Uh, the uh, existing future land is clearly not uh, inconsistent with what is being used on the property. This has gone on for decades, as I point out in my staff report, so it's time to clean it up, particularly since there are indications that they want to do some improvements on the property and uh, we would need to clear the way. And most of the property, I pointed out in my staff report, are all industrial up in there, very heavy industrial in the county. So it's clearly uh, land use that fits in up there and it would bring this uh, property into compliance. 
Uh, as the property is more than 10, 10 acres, we have to send it off to uh, Department of Economic Opportunity. Uh, the only thing I can say to you is we're in the deadline on our comp plan, so it's very possible we won't be adopting this. It'll have to come back to you all. It'll probably be a few months before we actually adopt this after we get through the comp plan. So just so you're aware and nobody asks me what's going on, but it should not delay what uh, any proposed improvements out at the at the the site. So unless you have some specific questions of me, I would suggest we open it up for hearing. Well, just one quick question. I assume this is the first hearing? This is it. This goes off, you remember, the ones that have to go to the state, we send off, they go to the state and wander around for <laughs> weeks. Well, I'm just I'm looking then, at then they the, come back and yeah. we schedule a hearing to adopt it. The reason I ask, I'm looking at the mechanics of the, of the, yeah. the effective date and I'm seeing 2015 on here. So, I mean, if we approve it, we... we oh, well... Oh, you mean on the, there's 2015, the, 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 but the approval should have a 2016. If not, we'll, we'll change it before we send it off to the state. All right? Good okay. point. Mm. Uh, Councilman, any questions? Does the public have any comment? If not, we'll accept a motion. I'll make a motion. Hold, to, hold on, Mark, did you? Oh, want? I'm sorry, Mark. Mark Mutual 617 Indian Lilac Road. Just as a matter of curiosity, um, it, aren't there any special procedures for removing land from uh, conservancy? Uh, what well, it's the it's any as it's like any uh, future land use designation. We have data analysis shows clearly this was an inappropriate designation. Why it ever was done that way. I can tell you I have no idea, and I wasn't there when they did it, but I think it's time we clean it up. It makes no sense, and uh, since you, uh, so I think there's certainly enough data analysis on there to, to uh, validate this. Uh, so it's a designation conservation. It isn't conservation as in a conservation easement or a covenant on the property. So All you right? see no problem in the mechanics of moving forward? No, I don't. Okay. <clears throat> All right, can I make a motion then to approve it? I so do. I have a second? Second. second. Uh, Tammy, let's go ahead and have call or roll. Mr. Howell? Yes. Mr. Winger? Yes. Mrs. Turner? Yes. Mr. Old? Yes. Mayor Kramer? Yes. Uh, would you read the next one, Ms. Falk? An ordinance of the City of Vero Beach, Florida, amending Chapter 62, Article 3, C1A, C1B, B1, and C1 Commercial Districts, and Article 10, Downtown District of Part 3, Land Development Regulations, and the Code of the City of Vero Beach, to provide for government use as a permitted use, providing for codification, providing for conflict and severability, providing for an effective date, requested by the Planning and Development Director. Oh, thank you. Um, as I pointed out in my, uh, this is the second hearing on this, I point out in the first hearing that this uh, uh, proposal is really to address a, an immediate problem which had to do with the bus shelter that Goline was trying to put on vacant property and since it's not a principal use it kind of made it difficult we could not approve it at that location so that cleans it up but it also improves the code where we have some more flexibility and what type of uh, government uses that can go into, into the downtown and other commercial districts. Um, and other than that, I think that's pretty clear. <laughs> so unless you have some questions of me, I'd open it up to the final uh, public hearing. This is another one of those that's got 2015 all over it, but I'm sure that's just mechanical. Is there any member of the public that would like to speak on this issue? If not, the council discuss or a motion? Move for approval. Second. Oh, second. Well, Mr. Howell. All right. Uh, Ms. Fogg? Mr. Howell? Yes. Mr. Winger? Yes. Mrs. Sterner? Yes. Mr. Old? Yes. Mayor Kramer? Yes. Next, we'll move on to a uh, resolution uh, with the step system and a lien. Who wants to uh, make a presentation on this? I will read the title. A resolution of the City Council of the City of Vero Beach, Florida, establishing a special assessment lien in the amount of $4,845 for a septic tank affluent pump step system to serve the rural property located at 4504 Sunset Drive, Vero Beach, Indian River County, Florida, providing for an effective date. Requested by the City Attorney. This is a step system that has been installed as verified with the Water and Sewer Department, and the costs were consistent with what was estimated, and this is the lien that uh, uh, secures the repayment to the city of the costs involved. Uh, I don't know if Rob wants to add anything or Cindy, but this, uh, I think they probably already made their first payment in advance, so 
It just secures the money that's owed to the city for the work. Okay. Wayne, I have a procedural question, Mr. Mayor, if that's okay. Please do. Uh, are we going to see a lot of these? Uh, I mean, I think that Rob would know better. I, 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 I we've think they're very, rather automatic. I think this is know. only like the second one we've had. But the lien has to be established by a resolution. That's oh, why okay. it's in front of the council. State law. Requires. I would, I would say, overall, you're seeing right now 95 percent of the people are paying upfront and taking advantage of the incentive program. Um, a few are taking advantage of the payment plan. You'll probably see that with more multifamilies because they have to pay for more impact fees. So therefore, they're the. I, I, I would imagine they're going to roll that into a business cost and pay it a year by year and takes take advantage of of um, taxes that type of stuff. So, but in this case, um, it's just a single resident that that you know money wise felt it was better for her to go ahead and pay over time than it was to um, you know make the payments up front. Mr. Mayor, I have, I have no problem with this, but may I ask some more questions of uh, of uh, Rob, please? Yeah, have floor. Uh, I, I guess just two questions, really. How many have signed up, and where is the program as far as boring the lines in the city? I mean, where are we? Uh, we are currently, our staff has been working in the Bethel Creek area. We moved to the Live Oak area because we had some failing septic tanks in that area. Um, however, I just started working with Coastal Drilling, who did some of the drilling for the uh, electric. They have a contract with our electric fund, and so we're going to start utilizing them to do some more installations so that we can try to play catch up. Uh, we have fallen behind based primarily on the fact that we're we're jumping all around, connecting people up that have either a failing system or they're they're building new houses or doing some type of renovation and they can't pull or they yeah, immediate need. yeah i mean we're trying not to have them put in a new septic system so so we're effective i mean it's just we're not being efficient because i can't just sit in one area and put all the lines on in so we're trying to um take advantage of the contract we have with coastal uh we also are under a deadline as far as um some grants that we receive, so trying to take advantage and receive money from the state for it, uh, it pays us to go ahead and you know utilize uh, Coastal to try to play a little bit of catch up. We'll watch how our funding is. Right now, we're well under budget for what we originally proposed um, and that the council approved. Um, we have roughly 20 people that have connected at this point. We probably have 36 or 40 applicants that are wanting us to, you know, they're just sitting there ready, readily available once we have the lines in front of them. We haven't sent the first letter out. So I, I, that's the next wave that I expect is once somebody formally gets that letter and says, you have now a year to take advantage of this savings program, then you're going to have the next round of people jumping in and wanting to get connected. So I'm pushing those letters off so that we get more lines in, play a little bit of catch up and then get the letters out. So once we finish, like Bethel Creek, for existence, for for example, then we'll send the letters out to the whole neighborhood. So you're you've done the, the lines on the street in Bethel Creek and Live Oak, is that correct? We have the south end of Bethel Creek, and right now along Live Oak and some of Indian River Boulevard on Mockingbird, there's lines available for people to connect up to. Uh, now Coastal is in; they're they're working on both Eugenia and Day Palm today. Uh, one thing you can go out and look at is on our website, we have an interactive map. By clicking on it and bringing it up, you'll see where it, it, we will turn the color of the lot to salmon color, meaning that the line is in front of that property and they can go ahead and connect. Uh, those that connect up that are using a drain field or a light green. So it'll show you the ones that have connected up and still have a drain field in place. Those that are a darker green are ones that went ahead and just put a whole brand new system in and um, to, do not have a drain field as a backup, but have the larger tank as a backup. Thank you. Ms. Turner? Um, yes, Mr. Alton, reviewing the report that you sent out to council on the 14th of December, giving us the statistics and, yeah. Hopefully I got my number, my, all my numbers or percentages right. But the way I looked at it was that 
for our septic tanks, the single family parcels, we have about 33% of those areas that potentially could hook up their septic tanks to the step system, that we have those lines, that capacity available. Correct. And I think in the time period that we've had this program in, I think having 30% of that available you know, has been good progress. And I looked at that we're close to of that those that have the capacity that we've had about a 20% of those people responding, yes, we'd like to hook up to step system. And we all realize it's a subject to uh, the age of the, of the septic tank that they have, its condition, et cetera. So I think we've had a, a, a successful program going forward, and I think continuing to raise awareness in the community of this. And as you say, when, by the time you get those letters out again and saying, hey, It'll showing be, that opportunity, you're going to be swamped again. We're going to be so. swamped again. So, <laughs> so I don't want to do that. That because you know, and and yeah. and it's tough, and and you get phone calls every day. Like we got two more this week that the holidays were there, relatives yeah. were in. All of a sudden, think something sluggish, and when can I connect? So, so, and I appreciate your efforts in trying to respond to those. Yeah, you know, I consider kind of urgent needs at right. that point. That saying, hey, you know, let's not put in another septic tank. Let's try to cooperate with them. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Mayor, are you ready for a motion? I'm ready for a motion. Before you do that, um, the, the property owner has the right to have be heard if she's present, Ms. Uh, Ray, if she's here, or, or the public in general. Well, is there a member of the public that likes to speak on this one? If not, I'll make a motion to accept uh, 5A, the lean in 4504 Sunset Drive, Vero Beach, Florida. Second. Was, just just for clarification to make sure that we all understand the council has taken action which allows the administration to accept the easements for these the only thing you will get are those that are required by law when there's a lien potential lien that would be imposed on the property to recover the money so we are progressing and proceeding down the line and so the great majority you will not see it'll only be on the, the this type of an occasion that will happen the next thing I want to point out is Rob has been very successful in grant getting grants we're over around five hundred thousand dollars in grants that allows us to use that money in order to have Coastal come on and expedite what we're doing. So it's been very successful from that standpoint. And as he says, this is word of mouth and the city of Vero Beach have been calling us saying we're ready to sign up. So. Jim, one other thing on that whole subject. Uh, this Wednesday, the city should be represented by, uh, you know, somebody on your staff at the any River Coalition, which is going to be in Sebastian in the morning. I believe I've got the date in place correct. In other words, uh, there's going to be talk about further grants and procedures and so on. Yeah, we'll, we'll have somebody there. Thank you very much. All right, we've um, got Mr. Howell. I have a question for the Please. city manager. Uh, Mr. O'Connor, do I understand correctly that some of these grants within this $500,000 have an expiration date? And if so, uh, do you have an idea of what those dates are? I don't have those dates with me now, but as Rob said, we're expediting the work in order to expend that money on the intended purpose, which is to get this system uh, available to the public. But we have two different years of grants. Yeah, well. most of them expire. Well, for getting the lines in, um, our original um, and work schedule had us going to about March of 2017. Um, the second grant that we were awarded was for putting in the actual connection laterals. Uh, I'm working with them on that finalizing that grant. The monies are only available for 2016 and 17. I don't think we'll be able to take a full advantage of that funding because I don't see us being able to get all of the laterals in by September of 2017. So I'm hoping to take advantage of at least 70% of that that available funds, which was 247000 So we're hoping to take full advantage of the initial funding of 292000 from St. John's to get the lines in, and that's what the big push is going to be. The other, you know, they offered 247000 I'm hoping to be able to take advantage of about 70% of and that. And that question was just more so to satisfy my curiosity, so mm -hmm. thanks for your answer. Okay. Can you, can you extend that expiry date? I, I I'm trying to. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so we'll see how yeah. we can work it out. But yeah, yeah. we're what, trying to. It's just the, their funding, what they try to do now is lock. They, I, I really like what St. John's is doing. They're moving away from a lot of um, 
funding that they did on studies and stuff, but nothing ever got built, to now funding actual projects. So a lot of times, that you know, like with us, it's perfect. It, we're taking yeah. advantage right. of it because we're we're going to spend the money no matter what, and yeah. and we're more or less saying to St. John's, if you want your name associated with it. Please come and give us some money, and, yeah. and it's working. However, they're doing two-year windows on this these funds. So we actually were ranked, I think, 16th, and they funded originally the first 15. Mm-hmm. Well, then people weren't ready for the two-year window, so they called us after the fact and said, hey, are you ready to go right. to construction? Right. So, yeah. so we said, yeah. yeah. So you know, we can maybe apply for the second part of it maybe next year, but we'll, we'll get thrown back in that window of – the yeah. evaluation process. So, I have a motion and a second. Um, the vote. Yeah. Okay, Ms. Fock, would you uh, call a roll call? Mr. Howell. Yes. Mr. Winger. Yes. Mrs. Turner. Yes. Mr. Old. Yes. Mayor Kramer. Yes. We have no public items, Ms. Fock. I don't believe you have any. Um, I did just want to mention trying to set up a city council workshop. We're looking at January 26th at 9:30. If anybody has any problems with that date, if you Please let me know. And also, um, just for a point of information, Mr. Winger appointed Mr. Stephen Lapointe to serve as his appointment on the Utilities Commission. Uh, Mrs. Bach, where do we have vacancies? I'd love to know. Um, we have vacancies on our Code Enforcement Board, on our Historic Preservation Commission. Um, you will need to make a replacement on the Finance Commission. I will do that. Okay. And um, our Tree Commission has two openings. On the uh, Finance, I have uh, a series of interviews going this week. I'll have somebody by Monday, which I think will be before the next meeting. The the, um, the, the subject for this January 26th meeting is... Uh, number one, to um, come up with some guidelines on how we judge the three people that report to us. And one is Jim, and one is um, Wayne, and one is um, Tammy. We've got, we, we have to do reviews on them, and so we have to sort of figure out a process to do that. And that's one of the subjects on that meeting. The other is just to sort of see, just to talk amongst ourselves, even though it's a public meeting, about what we'd like to get done during this next year. Um, so if any individuals have some ideas or plans or concepts that they want to work on, that's a good time to, to be able to talk about it. Okay. okay. If, uh, if any council member wants to make any, I mean, that's just going to be like a normal meeting. If you have a subject that you'd like to talk about, uh, submit that to uh, the Tammy and we'll get it on there for, for discussion. Uh, Tammy, we're done. You're yes, finished? Thank okay. You. Uh, Mr. O'Connor, you're up. Uh, I have a couple items. One, the first one is the discussion regarding the potential elimination of the electric utility impact fee. Uh, just for explanation here, we have put in abeyance collection of the impact fee, waiting for a direction from the city council as to what we're doing. But it is all uh, predicated on the fact that we can go back and the developers understand that they would have to pay that if the council chooses that we continue the impact fee uh, process. But uh, the issue of impact fees came up. We did a study. We talked to our, uh, uh, our rate consultants on impact fees. It's sort of one of those dinosaurs in the industry. We're one of the very few that have impact fees. Uh, Fort Pierce, as an example, uh, when we imposed impact fees, they imposed impact fees. They quit imposing impact fees several years ago. And so in order to try to eliminate that, that process, we sent you the information pertaining to the uh, uh, revenue stream that this generates. In the 14-15, it was 129000 Our average over the last five years has been right at $159,000. Percentage-wise, that's a rel- relatively small amount of revenues coming in for capital projects. We think we can make that up in other uh, areas. Also, when we do our rate structure analysis as part of our rates, uh, one of the things Florida Power and Light does is they shift some of their imp- uh, their uh, uh, rates as it uh, goes toward the uh, impact on the system to the pr- prospective users and have generated the revenues as opposed to impact fees. But again, we've passed this through both the finance department and the uh, electric utility 
and I think it's unanimous in our recommendation that we uh, eliminate that. If the council chooses, we have no problem making presentations to the Utility Commission and then back to the City Council. Mr. Mayor, can I comment on Today I'd vote against this. I mean, this represents a, uh, probably a quarter of 1% increase in our power rates if it was taken, and, and eventually all money trickles into the power rates. So uh, my sense is I would like to see the Utility and Finance Commission look at this and consider it. I, I never am that concerned with what others do. The question is what we should do and what's in the interest of the ratepayers. So I, I'd very much like to, to have the counsel of our commissions on this. Okay. Is there any other opinions? Is there any objection if we do that, that we hold in abeyance the collection of the impact fees at this point until the final resolution? I would hate to collect the impact fee today and then... No, I would certainly make the motion, Mr. O'Connor, that we hold, yeah, that we don't hold the collection of those fees in abeyance. Until Before we get a second, we have public comment. Mark Mutcher again. Um, just a question. The impact fees, when you did collect them, the, the, did they go straight into the electric fund and into the capital fund? Yes, sir, they did. And that for. capital fund, as a result of the uh, closing of the plant, is going to be considerably decreased. So wouldn't the, the loss of that impact fee possibly not have any impact? On, on the rates? Well, what typically happens is when we reduce our capital investment in the power plant, next thing you know, we start doing undergrounding. You know, the city did that several years ago. That goes into the capital projects as well. Uh, and then we start doing other things. I'm not sure that closing of the plant, it does reduce our exposure to capital expenditures. I agree with that. But a lot of times we become a little more creative in things we want to do in the utility system. So I don't want to completely negate that. But again, as a percentage of what we're talking about here, it's a, a relatively small revenue stream. Uh, yeah, I understand now. Um, and as an aside, I, I realize you've got money you want to spend. As long as you spend it on reliability, I'm happy. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, yes, sir. You. And we are paying close attention to our substations. Ms. Turner, would you do me a favor and restate your motion and we'll get a second? Yes, and I, I move that we suspend the collection of electrical impact fees until um, a resolution on their future. Okay, do I have a second? I, I'd like to amend that, that uh, my amendment to the resolution would be that this will go first the impact fees will be held in abeyance, but the matter will be considered by finance and the utilities be, and come back at that point. So is there a second to that? Well, I think that's what she... Uh, uh, whoever, yeah, the, that, that certainly was the intention, but if he cares right. to specify it that way, that's I'll fine. second that. Okay. <laughs> All right, so then we have a second on the uh, amendment. Do we have a second on the motion overall? Yes. Okay, I have a second on that. Um, all in favor, say aye. 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 Opposed? You've got consensus. We'll proceed on that. The uh, next item of discussion is the reverse osmosis uh, plant, uh, water plant treatment facility. This is expansion of the uh, treatment facility at the water plant. What this is to try, what we're trying to do here is to get out of the shallow wells and go to the deep wells for better water quality, as, as better uh, reliability in the water itself. This is awarding a contract in order to facilitate that. We went out for bids. I think that uh, each council member has received a copy of the uh, recommendation from the city staff for this expansion of the reverse osmosis. Be very happy to answer any questions. Just so everybody hears the lowest bidder is $2,379,000, and it's Florida Design Contractors Incorporated. It is a budgeted item. Any questions? Yes, Mr. Mayor, I've got a couple of questions. Um, in the analysis, it talks about annual cost savings with this RO, and yet yeah, I didn't see I didn't any kind of estimate or any kind of substantiation to these annual cost savings that we're going to utilize for other projects. We, we, did, um, we did do it years ago when we originally did the, um, when we hired the consultant, and I forgot to put it back in again, but the la I'm thinking it, it was about $200,000 by the time 
it was all said and done. And I have a spreadsheet on it that's probably dated back in 2013 or 2012 when we analyzed it back in that day. Which is fine. I realize it's yeah, still another revamp yeah. of the system. But, but we have about that much. And, and most of it comes from um, the fact that we have a considerable amount of, of – um, surficial wells that constantly need maintenance. So we'll really cut back down on the maintenance of those wells along with the fact that when you're running those wells, you're not getting a whole lot of water out of them compared to running one Florida well that you're getting a lot of water out of. And um, just thinking out loud, I, I'm remembering that, the say, the cost per per thousand gallons was somewhere in the four and a half to five cents per thousand to pump out of the ground out of the Florida versus nine to 13 cents per thousand gallons to get out of their sufficient aquifers. And then you couple in there the maintenance, um, the cost of the chemicals to treat the water um, versus these newer membranes were lower pressure. So 20 years ago, it cost a lot more to run a reverse osmosis plant than it did a lime softening plant. Today, with lime membrane testing. technologies and the cost of chemical additions, and when you look at the total of pulling the water out of the ground to pumping it out of the water treatment facility into the mains, the cost now is very much similar. Um, and so now we're saving, you're seeing the other side now is the savings on a lot of the maintenance and everything and the activities that we have on it. So, so we roughly have about a $200,000 savings by, by doing that. Okay. Could you get the copy of that for our I sure will. I forgot all about. And included yeah. in the record for this item and appreciate that. Yep. And um, also we have um, just, we have a grant for this one also. So we were able to receive a grant for up to $900,000 for this project. It's a 33% um, matching, matching funds from St. John's. So so there is funding from St. John's for this. So you'll have six and a half year payback or something in that order if it's 200000 and thirteen it, remain. Yeah, we did that analysis. I just, yeah, I'd have I to remember. pull it up again, but off the top of my head. But yeah. very important, it is improving the water quality, which is the product, the end product. You know that we're trying to distribute. Yeah, so. your your water quality. One of the problems that we run with having a superficial aquifer is that you have a lot of organic matter in that. So <laughs> when you add chlorine to organic matter, you produce trihalomethanes, which is, uh, you know, something that's the regulation. The amount keeps dropping lower and lower over the years, and we've been successful in staying under the threshold. However, as wells degrade over time, and you start having more organics and everything else in it, you start bumping up against that line, you could have a water quality issue. Once you go to reverse osmosis, you don't have those issues anymore. So, Thank you. Is there any member of the public that wants to ask a question? I think I, you can I still pull our head well, I just want to get that out of the way. <laughs> okay. If you want to motion, you can do that. Okay. Yeah, still have questions. Um, we don't anticipate any service disruption then for our customers in the implementation no. of the system? No, no. And I didn't see any schedule either for this actual work being implemented? It, yeah, we, we will. It, the, contract, the contractor expects 240 days on site, total calendar contract of about 430 days by the time you procure all the equipment and everything else. So we're looking at about 430 days from today is when, or when they sign the contract that is going to be the construction window. So, and that fits in with that grant that's going to go to September of 2017. So. When you did the bid tabulation, I didn't see any comparison schedule um, compared times, to other bidders. I said timing, oh, obviously six times money. And I think that's still an important thing when we do, when we present a bid tabulation that we see that information as well. Okay. What is the status of the uh, current unit? I, 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 I think it was in here, but I can't remember. Are the new tubes in? The new membranes are in, and that's operational. Right. Um, and the sequencing of how we'll do the work, uh, and, and you approved back in June the, the high-pressure pumps. So they should be here somewhere in March, sometime in March. Um, the contractor will go ahead and install the two new skids, get those completely operational, and then take the one that's there now oper that's operating down and, and redo all of the operating programming and everything else for that one. So we, we will not have a disruption. You may have like a day time or two days that it's down when you're transferring over, but that won't create an issue. But the existing one's got new tubes in it now? Yes. That Thank went you. in in, um, I think, 
August we came online with those. Ms. Turner, you're, you're right. We did not put a time in here. We did get five bidders, and the mm -hmm. bids were very, very close. Uh, Three hundred thousand dollars was the difference between the low bidder and yeah, the high bidder. Yeah, I was going to say, you know, on a monetary basis, and I assume yeah. they probably will be. But in, you know, in other cases, we'll, you That's can true. have a considerable. And Florida and Design has done some work for us in the past, and has been very. Yeah. Yeah. And what and we kind of did on this bid because we were not necessarily in a time crunch window, we allowed the bidders to pencil in the time frames that they had. And I think that laid into a lot of why we had very good pricing and, and under budget and everything and else. That's part of, and, yeah. and you're right. I, we should have, I never caught that. We should have put those down on the outside of that Thanks. evaluation. With that, I make a motion for approval. I'll second it. Okay. All in favor, say aye. 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 And motion passes. Mr. Command, you are next if you have anything. I don't have anything else unless someone has something. I have a, I, I have a question. Go ahead, Ms. Okay. So, That's Ernest. okay. I've got to, I'll find my paperwork anyway. Well, uh, my question is, I was amazed that the stack of paper is that high with the city's position on the uh, short-term rental of Charles. Is it Charles Fritz case? Do I have it, the name correct? Yeah. Is there any comment on that? I was amazed how many... <laughs> How much paper it was? It was uh, be more a good, huh? <laughs> yeah, There'll be more paper. Our, uh, Mr. Frost has just made a request to him for a lot of his whatever documentation he has <clears throat> to support his case. But it's, uh, I, I would tell you, it would take a, I, I tried to read the thing, you know, both the covers, which are many, many pages long, and it would take a Philadelphia lawyer to. Yeah, the uh, that motion the, you're probably talking about the filing on the motion for summary judgment, yes. which they filed and we opposed, of course, and that was uh, any ruling on that was postponed for 45 days because they just really filed their motion prematurely. It's we're still in a discovery phase. Uh, I know uh, uh, John has got the deposition of Mr. F uh, Fitz scheduled now. I think for around the 18th or 19th of this month. Well, yeah, my question was kind of along this line. We received um, a notice of supplemental authority. For those of us non-lawyers, can you tell us what the significance of that was? <laughs> All that is is uh, if after you file a pleading or some case law with the court for them to you know for the court to consider, if you find something else, that's just a method of getting in front of the court to to bolster your arguments. Okay. Great. Thank you very sure. much. Any other questions? If not, Mr. Howell, you have the floor. I do. Thank you. Um, I want to speak briefly today with regard to, can everybody hear me okay? With regard to the stormwater utility, which was to be brought forth early on the agenda in 2016, I just wanted to go ahead and bring up my concerns for the utility um, before we even get started on it. Um, I've had a lot of concerned citizens approach me with regard to this utility and the creation thereof. And some of my concerns with this utility are, um, and I'll make it fairly simple, uh, it creates a regressive tax, much like the utilities that we pay today. It's another line item on your bill. And so what that means is that it's a greater percentage of the income of a poor or, say, a middle-class family that it is for someone who's very well-to-do, uh, which helps to drive away people in our community that we want and, and need. And I believe that that is unfair in and of itself. Um, also bypasses the homestead exemption that these folks might have if it becomes a line item on the utility bill that you already receive. Um, it's also something, as we've seen so many times before, uh, that will never go away. In fact, uh, it will likely grow, and, and so too will the cost. They will grow, um, which, and, I, and I don't think anyone could argue that. Um, there's a there's a there's another item, and I'm kind of stepping off of where I wanted to go with this. But there's a question in my mind about the pervious area for commercial businesses. Now, if commercial businesses are also going to be paying for this utility, and it's based on pervious area. Uh, I can surmise that there's some businesses out there with large parking lots, maybe a church, for example, that are going to be paying hefty fees. Uh, with the way that it's been proposed to, to be structured. Um, 
and I don't, I don't think I'm wrong in saying that, um, but if you step outside of, you know, the numbers that have been thrown at us in the past, $5 here on average, maybe $8, which will increase over time, I can promise you. Um, if you're talking about a commercial business with lots of pervious area, that, that number increases likely exponentially, uh, which to me is also not fair. Um, let's remember that there's already a system in place that takes care of this stormwater utility, and that's um, Monte Falls Department of Public Works. Um, and Public Works is funded by the general fund and is subject to the general fund budget process. So it's my intent, it's my intention today uh, to make a motion that any and all stormwater projects brought forth or handled by Public Works and are funded by the general fund and its process. Is that a motion? I'd like to make that motion, yes, sir. And I'll second that motion. Discussion? Well, you know, the rebuttal on this thing may rebut it, though, Mr. We are in Connor. discussion. Well, first of all, we have no idea what this would look like until the study is finished. We should finish the study. Uh, secondly, we're at this point in time, we have no money in this year's budget for one reason or another. Uh, if we had kept going at the rate of four or five hundred thousand dollars a year, it would have taken us 19 years to get to 67 percent of the outfills. Right now, we're at 37 percent. We're going to fall short of the state mandate at some time in the future for what we put into the river. This is an issue of the river. You say it'll never go away. If we had it, it could be sunshine. I said that initially when I presented it. It's not necessarily a fee on the utility bill. We have no idea. It could be an ad valorem tax. It could be taken out of the general budget. There's lots of ways it could be done. No one knows the size of the fees. You say hefty. I don't know where you get that from. In, in, my, in the case of my particular house, I'd pay no fee because when I build it, it it's completely self-sufficient from the point of view no water goes anywhere. Uh, so I think we need to understand an issue, particularly when the lagoon is dying. And we need to understand an issue. We know that the septic tanks and the runoff are the two largest issues we have. Beyond that, virtually every modern city around us, Fort Pierce, Sebastian, you name them, have stormwater utilities. We have a real bad problem. I think we're going to have an interesting debate of how we do this. I mean, it could be taken, uh, it, we could have funding out of the general budget, but to do that, I suffered through the budgets. I've done it five years now with my year on the finance, and I've got to tell you the budget's extremely thin. If you tried to take this out of the existing budget of the city, you'd have to take it out of the lifeguards or the police or recreation. You'd have to take it out of Leisure Square or having fewer lifeguards or fewer police. People will get hurt. So, you know, uh, I think this is one of these things, and I want to, I want to, I want to say something else. This is one of these things I think takes long-term consideration. I, and, you know, we've talked about having a uh, referendum on it. I have had large numbers of people coming to me in favor of a stormwater utility, overwhelming numbers. You know, we have another problem in the budget, and that is the OEB, in other words, the deferred benefits for retirees. And we're short four or $500,000 there, and we haven't resolved that issue, let alone we don't have any money for stormwater, and we have about half enough for the streets. So, you know, I, I think this whole discussion will run all the way through the budget sessions of how we should handle OEB, the stormwater utility, and the streets. And I think to make a motion at this point in time uh, to kill something that you don't understand that we simply have to have. I mean, you're going to run into a problem eventually if you don't spend money where we're going to get state action against us because we're dumping into the lagoons stuff we shouldn't be dumping. You know, remember one other thing. Uh, as was, as Mr. Uh, 
as Carl said earlier on, this area was a swamp originally. I remember also when Riverside Park was a swamp. I guess I'm the oldest timer up here, but uh, other than Harry. But, you know, the reality of it is that all water goes to the lagoon. So everything that comes off the streets, everything that comes off yards, uh, everything that comes off any place goes into the lagoon. Uh, we have a mess in the fingers. You know, we have sludge. We have all sorts of problems. So I, I don't, I, I respect your opinion on it, but I don't think you want to throw the baby out with the bathwater. I think you want to have mature consideration. I mean, I don't think you're suggesting that we not do something about stormwater. And if, you're, and if you're suggesting that we should do something about stormwater, but it should be in the ad valorem taxes, uh, I would submit to you that what you're doing is you have an unfair tax because you're putting it on the working people when much of the problem is institutions around the city that don't pay taxes. And I don't think that's fair. But I do think it should be part of the entire process, uh, the budget process and so on. I don't see this thing going forward short term. But I do think that you just simply cannot let water pour into the lagoon. And you campaigned in favor of the lagoon. So I, I think we need, I'm more than willing to have mature conversation about this. But I will certainly vote no to something that kills it today, and particularly when we're going to have to spend the remaining $53,000 of the $102,000, $104,000 bid. I mean, I think that's crazy. Before we get Thank too, you. Before we get too far, is there any members of the public that would like to speak on this? I couldn't hear. Did they ask for public comment? Yes. Uh, my name is uh, uh, Deborah Ecker. I, my, our property is at 550 Rio Mar Drive within the city of Vero Beach. Uh, I'm speaking on behalf of the Indian River Neighborhood Association, um, for which I serve as the chairman of that organization's Water and Lagoon Committee. Uh, what is not clear here to date to us is why this program should even be a subject for debate. It was a, almost a decade ago that your council adopted the Stormwater Outfit, Outfall Retrofit Capital Improvement Program. This is a program that's on the books. Its very sensible purpose was and is to install devices on the city's many outfall pipes to prevent or at least greatly reduce vegetative materials and solid waste from flowing directly into the lagoon. The proposed stormwater utility is not a new level of government. It's simply a sensible way to allow the existing staff to implement a pro this program's usefulness, which has languished due to lack of funds out of the general, uh, money out of the general fund. And so this is a being allowed just think of the sludge and muck and the nitrates and phosphates that are accumulating in the bottom of the lagoon because of this. What could be a more basic policy for your council to approve than doing what can be done to protect this stretch of waterway within our city's limits? Can any of you disagree that the water, that the lagoon is not an important a need a critical asset to our community? Can you imagine what a loss in property values would occur if this waterway were allowed to further deteriorate to a dead, polluted body of water? So we don't have to talk about protecting the lagoon because of its importance as a habitat for turtles or other marine vert creatures. This is business talk. Preventing pollutants from going into the lagoon is essential to protecting the city's long-term financial health. Can, think what, what property tax revenues we would lose if this water body were allowed to deteriorate. Your council has already taken in 
important protective steps by extending your wastewater collection system. And you heard more about that this morning and it's going forward, we praise that program. This is a program to complement that project. The baffle boxes and plexi pave units that this program will install on the, are not high tech, they're low tech. Everyone can understand how they're constructed and how they work. And they're relatively inexpensive. As for paying for them, maybe you want to increase property taxes. Is that what would have, that's what would essentially have to happen if they were going to be funded out of the general fund with, without cutting other essential services. Covering costs through assessments on property owners by way of a fee structure that is proportional to a property's area of runoff directly charges those who cause the most damage. It may be that there will be a beneficial consequence of this assessment structure, which will convert property owners to use, instead of black topping, will use materials that actually do drain into the uh, soil and sand beneath them, instead of running in sheets into the outlet pipes. Your Department of Public Works, I wonder if Mr. Howell, who has presented this motion, is aware of a report. It was very, I was enormously impressed with this when I first saw it. It's a memo from William Messersmith, uh, the assistant city engineer. This is, goes back a couple of years, so you may not be aware of it. He presented this, it was a very long document, well not that long, but about four or five pages in which he meticulously explains the purposes of this program, and I just have to read a few from that. He, they identify that there are 128 waterway areas, watershed areas within the city limits, and so far, because of lack of funding within the general fund, they've only been able to protect, install corrective outlet outfall protective devices on 24 in 24 of these areas they consider this they have again they have established uh, priorities i mean this is not just a casual program they've established priorities based on the criteria of what are we the largest areas that we can capture through these outfall pipes where is the most serious evidence of the nutrients going into it what is the most cost effective and they have priorities one of them i want to show want to point out is this area that is shown in this slide you can you see this slide from where you yeah, are yes, i can't tell yes, uh, this is the little I don't know whether you can see, but what the, what the, actually your staff prepared this, and that is that they cord, they pull together two sets of data. One shows with little yellow circles where the outfall pipes are, and those massive purple areas are where the scientist Edie Witters uh, a few years ago identified the heaviest pollution. Well, you can see they absolutely. They're, they're the same areas. Where those outfall pipes are, that's where the heaviest pollution is. That's what's happening throughout the watershed of the city. And uh, just please keep that visual aid in mind. Now, if this were ever to go to a referendum, there's just no question in my mind that the citizens seeing information like that, visual aids, and the type of data that is presented in this, this would be overwhelmingly supported. This is not an expensive program, but it's a very important one. Please do not even consider dropping it. Thank you very much. Mr. Mayor, this... Oh, hold, hold on a second, I've Ms. Turner. Yes, Ms. Turner, it's nice to see you and so delighted that you were impressed with that report. Back in 2012, when I brought the fertilized ordinance to the city... That was excellent, too. I Thank engaged you. Dr. Witter and brought her information to the city. In May of 2013, I requested our city department to please prepare a quantitative scientific data of the amount of pollution in the outfalls. And when you review the report that was done, you'll see that the city of Vero Beach not only meets the DEP's 50% reduction of nitrogen and phosphorus, which they say is healthy. Granted, this is you know a government standard. We want to be better anyway. But we not only meet that level, we exceed it by almost 30%. Now, once again, 
We have to take care of the lagoon. This is not a place to stop. But I want to say that, hey, we have taken steps to quantify it, to apply the science, to get the best bang for our buck when we're spending it, our taxpayers' money. I was out walking my neighborhoods. We looked at the FlexiPave system in four locations where they had they had been de- installed on Club Drive. They'd been replaced. And I'm sure it's because the FlexiPave does not sufficient for the water flow to go through and they were having floodings. So... Okay, we put this up to try to stop the organic matter, but we flooded our neighborhoods out. Those were all replaced now with a great system, so we're back at putting those organics in. You look at these areas on this map where you see in pollution. Go drive around Vero Isles. Every one of those yards floods right into the lagoon. There is nothing to stop that water from running, taking all the fertilizer, dog waste, whatever, right off those yards, right into the lagoons. I think there's a lot, a lot of things we can do, you know, and to continue to protect the lagoon. There's no question it's a huge economic thing. But the city of Vero Beach, we are less than 1% of the entire watershed of this lagoon. Less than 1%. So if we're going to do something, you know, let's try to spend our money as effectively as we can and to get the best, you know, results from it. I mean... I think we should continue with the Lagoon Projects, no question, up until, well, the last five years, we've averaged about $800,000 doing stormwater projects. Um, Prior to 2011, we had a separate stormwater department (coughs) that cost us $700,000 a year, averaging 11 people. But, you know, we weren't really getting anything more done. I think we've been effective in addressing the lagoon. I think we can continue to be so. But there is no need to create more government to do it. I, I respect your opinion. I don't know whether for me to make a response to it or not. Yes, um, be, be respectful. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm well, sure it's not a problem. Saying, no, I, I heard it uh, uh, IRNA absolutely does respect and thank your consul for the efforts they've made on the fertilizer regulations and on the conversion of septic tanks uh, to a system that will remove the most dangerous effluent into the system. But it's not only these properties that are directly on the lagoon, I agree, that have this is a problem, and we do need to enforce those fertilizer regulations and the, how clippings are made, but there's also the whole inland area of of, of, prop, of residential properties that are flowing into the ditches, the many miles, 400 miles of ditches and canals coming into the system. And they're just, there isn't, whether it's flexi pave or something else, I can't defend flexi pave because I'm certainly not in a position to do that, but there certainly needs to be an increase in the funding that goes into this program so that it's, it's complementary and it's just not allowed to just go fallow and be ignored. Thank you very much. Thank you. Mr. Thank Winger, you, you had a Yes, I, I have a question to Mr. O'Connor. We have a program this year in the original town in Kanish, uh on stormwater outfalls. How much is it going to cost, Jim? Monty, do you have that budget number? Monty Falls, Director of Public Works. Uh, Councilmember Winger, you're correct. We do have some projects in the McCanch Park and Original Town area that are subject to some grants that we have to provide matching funding for. I'll get those numbers, the exact numbers for you, but it's in the million dollar range for the total project. Uh, I'll, get, I'll get those numbers before the discussion. Well, I, I, I believe the, the grants are, there are two grants and they're, they are in the range of totaling 540 or something. That's ballpark. And we have to put 540 in. I have a question for Mr. O'Connor. Where are we going to get the 540 this year since we have no money in the budget? The answer to the question is, is that when we get closer to the time that those grants may be terminating, and if the council, for example, says that we're not going to do a stormwater utility, we either take it from fund balance, which would be an option for that one particular project, uh, or the other is, is we don't do the project. Well, and so my point, Mr. Mayor, is where we are is we have a project. We certainly are not going to pass up $540,000 of grant money to cure a problem that's not on the lagoon but is a major problem. This goes into the lateral canal. It goes into the main relief canal. It's a major problem. And we're certainly not going to turn the $540,000 down. 
What we're going to do is take $540,000 from our cash reserve, regardless of our cash reserve policy that is not finished not yet, and we're going to be spending reserves. I'd ask Mr. Uh, how does he want to, in the future, spend reserves, or does he have some way of reducing the city's expenditures enough that we can fund this? Because right now we can't. I, I'd ask for public comment. Mr. Stump, you're next. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Mayor, members of council, members of staff. Uh, Dan Stump, 615 Camellia Lane. <clears throat> I can appreciate Mr. Winger's real concern about this issue. <laughs> it's, it's come before the Finance Commission. I know at least once last summer. Maybe it's come before again. I don't recall it. But I don't think there's been a specific ordinance adopted for a stormwater utility. And I don't think Mr. Howell wants to just eliminate all concern about spending on the stormwater problem. There is a problem. Everybody wants to save the lagoon. You know, and I, I agree with, with the young lady who came and spoke before me from IRNA. But I think we need more information. There have been some good comments made. Uh, as far as the, I'd like to employ the rationale of Mr. Winger that if he feels it's necessary to send the electric utility impact fee back down before a, a joint meeting of the utility and finance, maybe we should. Certainly this should go in front of the utility and finance commission because nobody really knows what the costs are. Nobody really knows what the problem is. Personally, I think we have a problem with septic tank effluency going into the lagoon. And that problem dwarfs this problem. It's all over the county. We can maybe control what stormwater runoff goes into the lagoon from the city of Vero Beach. How do we control what comes down from Brevard County or the northern part of Indian River County? I don't know how effective a stormwater utility ordinance is going to be in that regard. But as I understand, Mr. Howell, he just wants to shift it to one area of the city, the uh, Mr. Falls Division. Am I correct? Or right that's, now, rather than eliminate it, that's you, right. you could try that out. And uh, with regard to the amount of money that it's going to cost, you know, we, we don't know that, but we don't know what our pending litigation costs are. I know, I know the city is confident in their views going forward with the Shores <coughs> litigation and the pending possibility of county litigation. You're already complaining about you don't know how much is in the budget for next year. Well, there might be less, you know. Finally, I would just like to say if it, if it ever goes forward with the stormwater utility ordinance, whether so there is a uh, ordinance created, let it be finally determined by a public referendum. Let the voters, let the property owners, the utility owners, rate payers, let them have the final say. Don't just ram it down their, their throats. Okay. Thank you very much. Mr. Mayor. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Stump, I, yes, I think I totally uh, agree with you. Uh, I didn't hear anything I don't don't agree with, okay. and I I think your major call, which is what my call is, is not for city. It was like if we, Mr. Uh, we had a conversation earlier about the 2008 OUC contract that it wasn't yes. done properly. Yeah, I think doing this properly says the city council does nothing today that it goes back to utilities and finance once we have the information and that we look at it materially and go forward that way. And, you know, I would suggest to Mr. Howell that that's the proper step, not to not to do anything today. There's there's no ordinance. There's no nothing. Good. And yet we've continued to, we've authorized the study on stormwater without any budget. We've now expended half of that money, and that wasn't any in the budget. You seem to be concerned about our cost spendings when it suits your purpose and when it doesn't. Y'all you know, authorized that without any funding. So that's part of the reason that, hey, shut it down now. We don't need it. But it's, the money is spent. So you're saying spend the money and don't lose no, anything. No, we've spent half the That's what the you're money saying, Mr. Turner. Turner. You're saying earlier. go ahead and spend money and don't get the results because you don't want to see the results. That's what you're saying. I, 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 that, that does bring up a good, good issue, uh, maybe a legal issue. Are we committed to spending the rest of the money that was initially uh, adopted or passed? Do we have to spend it? No, we have the contract has the termination clause in it. Okay, so that's we, something we else the finance utility anything. committee could review. It, it has to have to pay for any services that have been rendered yes. in any product, so, okay. which is approximately half. All right. Okay. Thank you all. Mr. Howell, you were next. Yeah, I'd like just a chance for a short rebuttal. Um, 
seeing that we are one of the, that we're 30% over what is required of us as far as cleanliness in the river. And um, seeing that I do believe that, you know, Mr. Winger um, said that, you know, who's going to be hurt? Um, I cannot stand behind a tax that, you know, for me, $100 a year estimated in the beginning, it's not going to hurt me. And there are probably families out there where $100 a year, it would hurt them. And as that increases over time, and it will, it's going to create even more pain for those those folks, and maybe eventually for me. I can't stand behind that. Um, I, I can't stand behind something that creates more bureaucracy that will never go away. It's not within my moral fiber to do that. Um, currently, nitrate and phosphate remediation is taken care of by Public Works, and clearly, based on the figures of being so, I use the term loosely, but clean, in our part of the lagoon, uh, they're doing a good job of the what they have today. And um, I think one other point I wanted to make, and I believe it was for, I believe, and don't quote me, it was for the electric utility. Mr. Winger said, well, you know, we can't look at what other cities are doing. We need to do what's best for Vero Beach. And, and I believe we, what's in the best interest of the people, the citizens of Vero and the Lagoon, is to keep this under control of public works and under the general fund budget process. So I stand by my motion. Just, just for clarification to make sure, number one, we're not creating any more bureaucracy. The way this stormwater utility is being designed, it, the money would go to capital projects, not to city staff. It would not be used on city staff. The, the other thing is now, when we say public works take care of of stormwater, which is fine, that means that the budget would have to be realigned if we want projects this year. If not, then we could do that again next year, but you have to put money where you want the projects done. And uh, Mr. Howe, you're right, the public works up until this point have taken care of stormwater utility, taken it out of general fund, but it has been at the sacrifice of other activities that the city would have been involved in. And so we just remember that there will be trade-offs and it could be a trade-off of personnel versus a stormwater uh, uh, project. So, I, no, in other words, you say trade-off. You mean hiring more? No, I'm saying the trade-off would be shift it to public works and say we're going to do a stormwater project with say McCamish Park instead of doing a project at Leisure Square. You would be doing McCamish Park, or you may have to lay some staff off somewhere in order to get the $500,000. Mr. Mitchell? You're not adding staff in any of those scenarios. Thank you, Mr. O'Connor. Uh, Mark Mutcher again. I've got a lot of um, thoughts on this, and you've heard most of them before, but I, uh, the reason there's nothing in the budget is because other than Harry and, and uh, perhaps Pilar, uh, you all played with the budget and the millage rate, played politics with the budget and the millage rate so badly, uh, worse than I've ever seen it before, and I've been watching it for 20, 25 years closely. Um, and you just put this aside and say, well, we're, we'll have, we'll uh, spend, uh, we'll use uh, stormwater utility income in order to, to do these kind of projects. And so that's that's why it's in, there's nothing in the budget. Um, don't you know? It's just so there's no mistake about that. The other thing, the other problem I have, and I've I've mentioned this before, is that uh, the majority of you up there have homes in the half a million dollar and above range. Uh, Pilar certainly does, but she's voting against her own self-interest again. Uh, as she continues to do her her economic her her pocketbooks, and um, I I don't believe that uh, Pilar or Dick Winger should pay the same amount that I do, or that some single mother down you know in a, in Osceola Park or some poor neighborhood uh, should pay it. it 
you got to figure out a way to make it ad valorem. And if you want to sock it to the churches and the not-for-profits and the schools and the, the subject of governments hasn't come up, I mean, you, uh, you guys want to pay it on the airport? I don't think so. Uh, although the airport's loaded, and that, and that doesn't affect doesn't affect the tax uh, roll, but so so that's a problem. Um, so, you know, I'd, I'd like you to put having this uh, uh, be an ad valorem tax, which wouldn't really hurt hardly anybody very much. Uh, but no, I shouldn't say that because um, as we talked about in the budget hearings, you. Y'all wanted to increase the, the um, budget $3 million, and numbers I've heard on stormwater might be $3 million. So we increased the budget 25 or more percent, uh, the tax budget, and um, this could be another 25 percent on top of that. So what you're effectively doing, whether it's... Uh, uh, on your utility bill or a non ad valorem assessment or an ad valorem assessment could be, uh, could work out to like a 50% tax increase combined with our, the existing 25% uh, tax increase. Um, another, um, it's kind of a separate subject, but it came up in this discussion. I just wanted to ask Monty um, about this success or failure or somewhere in between of this FlexiPave project because, you know, I have seen FlexiPave around wide open grates and, um, uh, and other places where they don't have, where it's either replace the grates or, or, or in addition to existing grates. So I don't know whether it's appropriate, Mr. Mayor, to have a little brief report on that or, or not, but I'd certainly be interested in it. Well, we've already got a motion in a second. I mean, I, I don't have a problem back up after it's, it's finished. If you want well, I don't need to come back up. We'll just put the question okay. out there, and then if you want to have an answer. Mr. Mayor, uh, thank you. Mark, while you're there, uh, if you needed five hundred thousand dollars, and if the taxes, if the ad valorem taxes are five million, I, I, I'm just picking numbers that are a bit more than five million now. If you needed five hundred thousand, I just picked the number out of the air, uh, which was the number we were talking about six months or nine months ago. That would cause you to raise the taxes from two thirty eight to two sixty one. It's just a number. I'm not suggesting raising taxes. Don't get me wrong. But it wouldn't be any doubling of taxes. But it, you know, I, I, would, I don't want any tax increases. And, and if I said doubling of taxes, I misspoke. I, I meant doubling our tax, in, our existing 25 percent tax increase. It would it would increase five hundred thousand dollars. The five hundred thousand is just for the the well, whatever the number project. is. Uh, I hadn't heard. Three million dollars for stormwater. Now we the original talk was five to six hundred thousand dollars a year over a period of years, but but we have no idea whether that's a wrong number or a right number until the study comes back. We have it no idea. It also started out as three to four dollars a month a person. It started out as five per month. Okay, because I'm the one that started it. I'm the author of and, it. And and you know it's not going to surprise me if it goes eight to ten to to even start. But that's. That's a political judgment, too. You know, uh, another, another issue, too, uh, Mrs. Turner said we're only 1% of the lagoon. I, I've had numbers of conversations with uh, the Lagoon Coalition, uh, with Senator Negron, our U.S. Senator, uh, Senator Nelson. And, and one of the things we know from the Chesapeake and from Tampa Bay, uh, one of the things we know is that no one government can solve the lagoon problem or the Chesapeake problem or the Tampa Bay problem. What happens in this country so often, whether it's a water problem or any other problem, is we say, well, let our neighbor do it. Well, our neighbors of Felsmere and Sebastian are facing these issues and facing them well. So let's let Sebastian and Felsmere do it. Uh, Fort Pierce is also. Our neighbors, Stewart, is also. But we're going to say we're not going to do our share. I think you, if, if we're to solve this problem or any problem in government, it means that each government must do its share. And our shares do something about all of the outfalls that are on that map that Mrs. Eckert had up here. I mean, there, there are a lot of them. 
Thank you. I'm going to let, let me let Mr. Whittle finish I, up and then I'll I want, close. I want a question, though, uh, uh, clarify. Um, Mr. Winger, you said that our neighbors, our Sebastian and Felsburg, are doing this in Fort Pierce. Are you trying to imply that because they have a stormwater utility, just that existence, that they are addressing these lagoon issues? Because I can assure you, all you have to do is go drive to Fort Pierce and you'll see all those main waters dumping into the lagoon without any filtration at all. I uh, would question how many baffle boxes, what progress of their reduction of uh, nitrogen and phosphorus those cities have done. If you're trying to tell me that they have done more than we have simply because they have a bureaucratic taxing authority of a, a stormwater utility, I disagree wholeheartedly. I think you're wrong with Felsmer and Sebastian, and I will be glad to ask uh, Mayor Hudson tomorrow what the specifics are. I think you're wrong there, too. But anyway, I'm going to let Mr. Worcester Whittle speak, and then we're going to close reference. public speaking. All right, Herb Whittle, 19 Park Avenue. I'm in Vero Isles, and I heard what Mrs. Turner talked about Vero Isles. Actually, it's mostly grass that goes down there, so when the water comes, unless it's really bad, it gets absorbed into the soil. The part that doesn't is, unfortunately, the part about three-quarters of it goes to the street. And then the street runs down, and then there is a pipe right into the lagoon. And this is what the $100,000 was in your budget that you took out. We were going to put baffle boxes on those pipes because that's much worse because the roads are probably the worst uh, polluter around. And yet this water rushes down the road and goes into a pipe right into the lagoon on Vero Isles because there's no baffle boxes. They're just a straight pipe. And that's what was going to be done, but you took it out of the budget because you're going to do it under the utility. Now you're going to kill the utility, so it's never going to get done, and we're going to keep polluting. Thank you. Okay, I'm closing public hearing. Randy, you've got the floor. Um, first of all, I think, I think the idea of this um, tax being to those people who are causing the problem, where the water is um, prevented from going into the, into the ground, and then it goes into the lagoon to, to, uh, to pollute the lagoon. The, the people who are doing this have an option to change the way the, the water hits their property by, by changing the, the, the surface and making it uh, more able to absorb so they can reduce the charge that, that is coming to them. I think that, that having a tax that, that is it is against those people a tax or a fee or whatever you want to call it. It's just against the people that actually create it is the way this should be handled. Um, and I think that we're only prop part way through the process. We don't know really what it's going to charge, every, what it's going to cost everybody, what the total package is going to cost, and how it's going to be set up. We've already set aside. We've got some money to do, go do this. We're already part way through it. Let's complete that thing and let's go ahead and bring it to a referendum. What we're suggesting today is let's not take it to a referendum. Let's not let the public choose. We know better than the public. Let's stop it right now. And I think that's really premature. I think we should be taking it. We should complete an idea of how to do this thing and then bring it to the public for their vote, not kill it before it gets there. I think this is a very important thing. I think what you were saying, Ms. Zecker, about the, the business side of this, this lagoon is very important to us for our the, the real estate values for the for the goodness of this neighbor this property this area is very important and I think we want to be a leader in our areas not say well uh, you know, our neighbors aren't doing it so we don't need to do it we ought to be a leader to it and so I think it's very important to follow through what we were thinking not kill it before it gets to a vote and let's uh, let's uh, um, let's let follow this all the way through. Councilman Roll, uh, are you suggesting that whether it's ad valorem or whether it's a line item on the utility bill, a regressive tax, it should go to referendum? Either way. I, I'm saying the authority, the, the, uh, the, um, the authority, the idea of an authority go to the referendum. So, so the, the yeah. creation of the yes. authority yeah. is what, okay. Yeah. Thank you for clarifying. Okay. Well, we've got a motion, a second. Um, my opinion on this is pretty simple. I don't like paying higher taxes, so large institutions don't have to pay anything. Um, I just think that's absolutely wrong. I'm not uh, big on using this as to, uh, as to be a, a great fundraiser. 
but certainly taking it out of the general fund is going to lower the, uh, the pressure on taxes, and the people that pollute the most should pay the most. Um, be a wonderful thing if we can get these large institutions to uh, get a program in, in, in play so that they're incentivized to stop dumping water into the stormwater system. Right now, they can build parking lots as big as they want without having to worry at all about maintaining. Uh, that's just something that I, I think is wrong. If you're you're that big uh, uh, that big parking lot that uh, causes the problem with wastewater, you gotta you gotta pay your fair share of it. And I'm definitely uh, definitely for this, but not as a huge funding issue. But uh, we've got a motion in a second. Is there any other comment? If if not, or if you guys want this until further on. I'd make a, an amendment to the motion to table it until after it goes to the appropriate commissions, which is what has to happen. Is there a second for that? I'll, I'll second that. That's, that's fine. What, 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 what are we going to take to the commissions? Well, we want to be able to get the details as to what the costs are going to be, what the structure is going to be, how it's going to work. So we'll proceed with the study and come yes. back with the results yes. and then go to the commission. Yes. Correct. Okay. Make sure I understood. Okay. Well, we've got an amendment to the motion. Um, all in favor of the amendment, say aye. 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 Opposed? Opposed. Opposed. To opposed. And now we have the uh, the main motion. The uh, So the main motion would be the amendment to, uh, instead of funding it by the general fund, that we would uh, fund it by a general fund and but we would go what to the the boards and commissions before we finalize is that what i'm hearing i think the amendment precludes the motion i think so too. yeah i think you, yeah. It, it, it it did I, certainly I, uh, essentially it was a vote yeah yeah amendment so. okay well we still got to, to, to vote on the uh, i don't think you may think about that yeah we, we've got to all Mr. in favor Howell of the main thought. all in favor of the main motion to uh, move it to the boards and commissions say aye Aye. 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 Opposed? Opposed. Opposed. Two opposed. Okay. Motion passes three to two. Um, new business. Um, I had uh, I had a conversation with the uh, the mayor of Indian River Shores uh, last week, um, and he expressed some interest in um, gaining more understanding as to. Um, the evaluation that uh, Mr. Sheffrat came up for the Indian River Shores. Um, I had uh, offered to him that I would take uh, take this take to uh, council the opportunity to have uh, Mr. Wright sit down with their representative to uh, go over those numbers and explain them in greater detail. Um, what it uh, what it turns out is that uh, you know this is something that we could just uh, we could ask Chef Wright to uh, simply go down the couple of blocks there in Tallahassee and uh, and meet with uh, I believe Terry Deason is the gentleman on the uh, the shore side there in Tallahassee, but this is going to expend a little bit of money, so I really can't authorize that. I need uh, the council to uh, to approve that authorization. I can't imagine it's going to cost that much money. Any, any questions? Yes, Mr. Mayor, I have a question. I I think it's wonderful at least to, to open the discussion and to try to vet these numbers. What I'm concerned about it is that as we've been dealing with these electrical issues, we keep running across this roadblock that this is proprietary data, that we cannot verify, we have no ability to verify these numbers. So are we just going to be going through an exercise once again that uh, Chef Wright comes up and says, hey, this is the number, and no, you can't look at it because it's proprietary data. You have no way of vetting it, so why are we going to go through this exercise again and spend money? Well, keep in mind, the proprietary data usually involves a third party that requests proprietary data. Um, that's not a fault of the government. That's not a fault of us or FMPA. It's, it's a fault of the business, the people that they do business with. Uh, simply, you know, Chef Wright has been here. You've had the opportunity to ask questions. We encourage people to ask questions. In fact, that's what this item uh, is about, uh, to allow the Shores to ask questions, to get clarification on that. And I'm giving them the opportunity to, uh, to ask those questions. And what I'm saying, is this, is this uh, financial data verifiable? 
You know, when they came up with the 60, I assume somebody has seen this number or the, or the backup of the 60 million that they threw out to Indian River Shores. Oh, are you, you know, is the backup verifiable? That's my question. Well, we, we've seen the backup to, to a, a 80% kind of range. What we haven't seen is the, the technical side of how they, uh, they project uh, rates um, on, on uh, oil prices. And that's the thing that's proprietary. Uh, an individual who, who projects rates uh, uh, is, pays, um, is, uh, is paid a lot to do that. And that's what's proprietary is his spreadsheets and stuff. Um, it's not the general, uh, not the general cost of it. So no, because certainly you, know. you can go and you can agree on the premises or what. Okay, right, right. you know this analysis is based on this, and these are the constants, or this is the um, the logic that we use to develop it. Um, like I said, I certainly would agree to setting some kind of a limit, but I want to know what the yeah, the objective of this conversations would be, and that that there is data that we can actually verify that will be of help. I think that's the point. The Shores wants to be able to have their gentlemen verify the data. Mr. It's uh, the opportunity. Mr. Mayor, Mr. Uh, a question, Mr. Connor and Mr. Comet. I do believe that any party can sign a agreement and look at the data. Is that not true? Or yes, sir. That's my understanding, and I don't know how much is proprietary other than Bill's numbers. But I think with Bill sitting down and he. Uh, presumably would also be part of that discussion, or at least his backup, uh, would be able to share that with another professional. We were He was ready to share with everybody else, but you had to sign one of these declarations. So, so that, in effect, uh, the declaration could be signed by and represented the, the, the expert of the town of Indian River Shores. Uh, yes, sir. And okay. two professionals talking like that, he probably wouldn't even be necessary because it's they both deal with the same proprietary uh, change of information. Mr. Mayor, do you have a clear objective of what would be accomplished with this? Well, or what is your objective, I should say? In, my objective is, is responding to the Shore's request for clarification on this information. They're a customer of ours. Certainly. They want to professionally go through those numbers and understand them. And I'm giving them that opportunity. Thank you. Just wanted to add, make that clear. Sure. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. <clears throat> Dan Stump again. All I know about this issue is what I read in the newspapers. And I think 32963 and the Press Journal do a pretty good job of covering it for the uh, for this uh, resident right pair. As I understand it, FPNL originally made an offer of $13 million to buy the Shores account. I understand the city came back with a counter offer of $64 million. That's not true? Mm -mm. It wasn't a counter offer. There was not a counter offer. It was not a counter offer. Well, then was there an acceptance or a rejection of FPNL's offer? If there wasn't a counter offer, what what did the city do? I don't know. I think it's just laying out there. <laughs> it, the sixty-four million was an explanation of what the impact would be to the city of Vero Beach upon the sale of those utility uh, customers. You're, you're saying there was, that there was. We really weren't bidding because we never had a time to sit down and, and bid, but the $64 million was reflective of the actual cost impact on the city of Vero Beach with the selling of those customers. Okay. So, you know, I understand the makeup of a contract. There has to be an offer by one party, and then there has to be an acceptance of that offer by the other party. And if so, you've got a valid contract. Sounds to me Dan, like... Dan, uh, let, let me clarify something real quick. Yeah. We did not really discuss the $13 million with Indian River Shores. Our discussions with, with Florida Power and Light, right. because those would be the people we were transaction. We did meet with them and showed them the outline of how that $64 million was raised, you know, the, the items that were included in coming with that number. They understood okay. it took place in my office, and okay. they understood what the components were that we were using. We did not come with that number at that point, but our, our negotiations really were with Florida Power and Light, not with Indian River Shores, because Indian River okay. Shores is not actually buying our system. Okay. So if you describe the $64 million as just an economic effect or a monetary effect on our system, okay, 
do we need to go to Tallahassee? If, if the number was derived from your office, do we need to go to Tallahassee to explain it? Can't we just have an informal meeting between the council and the shores, FPNL, any other party you want? Why do we have to go to Tallahassee and spend more money? They, want the, they wanted the details. The re only reason that we suggested Tallahassee was that the lawyers didn't have to make the travel time down here. It would be a lot cheaper for them just to, to meet up there. Um, well, are, are we wanted they, the experts in the rooms to talk to each other. Okay. Are they willing to do that? Yes. Okay. I mean, Vero, the shores? I believe so. Okay. Thank you. Mark Mutcher again. I, I don't have any problem, um, you know, further discussing these, um, you know, the offer and clarification on both sides. Uh, I guess my question is, from, from uh, an outsider standpoint, it seems like someone at the city gave Chef Wright uh, uh, the job to come up with the biggest, uh, let's say the safest number, which also is probably the biggest number he could think of, to, uh, I guess, not counteroffer the uh, 13 million and then of course the 13 million I think uh, you have to add to that the two hundred and fifty thousand dollars a month for two years that it was offered so that what's that bring it to 18 million or something so um, you know it's a, it, it's a lot of money and I think that um, uh, both Florida Power and Light and uh, Terry Deason from the Shores uh, had information on their side as to uh, why they felt that was a fair number. So it, it probably is a good idea for them to talk. Now, whether or not uh, Chef Wright, his, if his marching orders have been changed or not, or whether he's, he's the guy that negotiates for the city with no guidance from either staff or council, and that doesn't seem right to me. So it seems like it needs to be more than just the two of them in the room. And uh, I don't know what their policy is on, on charging for travel time. I know uh, Chef drives this little rice burner econo box, <laughs> so his travel costs aren't very high. But the, um, I don't know. It just seems like it needs to be more uh, of an open process than basically the guy that came up with the 13 slash 18 million dollar number talking to the guy that uh, came up with the 64 million dollar number. Both of both of which are pretty independent of uh, the parties, the actual parties to the transaction. Uh, I don't know how much input. Our staff, either from the city manager, or the finance director, or the electric utility director, had in coming up with that $64 million number. So I, I think a little more transparency and a little more input into this whole process is in order. Uh, Mr. Mayor, may I uh, ask a question of Mr. Common and Mr. Certainly. O'Connor. The $64 million uh, number, which was computed and which I looked at, did that number include all the contingent liabilities, things like uh, if something happens to St. Lucie number two and so on? The answer is no. It did not cover everything for what could be a potential out there. For example, the same thing that happened at Crystal River happened at St. Lucie two. That was not calculated into the number. Mr. M Mr. M Mr. Mutcher, my feeling is $64 million is too low a number. That's my feeling that it would not hold the city harmless because of this and other answers. You knew you made the infer uh, inference that the $13 million was founded. It was founded, $13 million was, hey, we'll give you $13 million and you have your choice between defeasing the transfer for a period of time, the loss of transfer of a million dollars a year or whatever it is. Actually, it isn't a million. It would be, uh, be uh, 550000 a year or you can use it to pay down your debt. It didn't deal with we're still stuck with St. Lucie 2, Stanton 1 and 2, 
OUC, we still have a contract with OUC. We've had one since 2008, whether we like it or not. It didn't deal with the problems of what may be under the plant. You know, the $13 million, with, uh, what I'm saying to you is, I'm going to say this very clearly, Indian River Shores has never come up, never come up, nor their consultants with a number. All they've came up is they so, said, you can, we'll give you $13 million and you can use it against this, whatever the real number is. I think 64 is a lowball number. But regardless of it, they have never come up with their own number. Now, what the mayor is saying makes perfect sense to me. If Indian River, if Indian River Shores doesn't want to pay to generate their own number, that's, so be it. But what he's suggesting is Mr. Deason would like to understand the numbers the city in all humility, and, and several of us up here asked that those numbers be generated. He's asking for the ability to go to the people, Bill Harrington, Chef Wright, and all those people, power uh, services or whatever their name is. And he's asking, said, well, we don't want to spend the money to generate our own numbers, but what we like to do is understand your numbers better. And I, don't, I think it's a reasonable request. I really do. Uh, good morning, Council. Uh, my name is Bob Awitter. I'm a member of the Utilities uh, Commission. I, I just want to follow up on Councilman uh, Turner's point. Uh, this was a source of a lot of discussion about uh, Mr. Harrington giving out his so-called proprietary uh, n numbers. And I objected during the whole procedure that the council did not, or excuse me, that the uh, commission did not have the opportunity to vet his numbers and see if there were errors in them. I think you do yourselves and the ratepayers at the service by not letting people see what those are. There's nothing proprietary about those numbers. If there's oil price projections going out years, there, I mean, Everybody puts out oil projections. The idea that this gentleman has some sort of magic secret sauce model that he can project where oil prices are going to be precisely five years from now. If he is, he'd be a multi-billionaire. I think it was just a subterfuge to not allow us to look at the numbers and have a proper vetting of it. So I, I, I would see. And f frankly, I objected during the procedures as to why the uh, city's uh, attorney, uh, well, it was the deputy attorney, I believe, that came in and, and talked, was letting them get away with this. We paid for those numbers. We have the right to say them. So that's just the point that I want to make. Thank you. Okay. Mr. Mayor, I'd make a motion to carry forth what you're suggesting here, if you would like it. I would definitely like it. Um, Before you vote, may I Please do, yes. Um, Laura Moss, Utilities Commission Member at Large. Um, this is a question. Uh, what Mr. Arwater uh, raised did happen, um, and both he and I felt quite unsettled that we did not have full information going into this uh, this OUC contract. Now it seems that they, uh, and, and I do agree, that certainly th this information should be exchanged. But my question is, is there a way to do it publicly so that everyone can understand? Because these numbers did seem to come out of thin air. Um, and they were so far apart. I think that uh, that everyone would like to understand them. If it has to be done in Tallahassee, can there be a transcript made, and can the transcript be made public, or is there another means of doing this in terms of making it public? I suppose we could. Um, I don't know. I mean, typically you, they they get in the room, they produce uh, their numbers. Uh, they don't have the threat of. Um, worrying about whether they're proprietary or not. Uh, I mean, if we want to pay a little more money, I don't have a problem if they want to do it here and sit down on the table and, and public and do it. It's just a matter of whether you want to pay for it or not. Yeah, or perhaps get an estimate. I, I felt it that uh, it was unfortunate that the, the discussion never came before the Utilities and Finance Commissions in terms of the valuation, that that issue uh, never came before you know the the commissions. The the number appeared the large number, the well, sixty four million. You can put that on the agenda if you but, like. Um, uh, well, then if if they're going to if if the person would, well the uh, the expert would explain it to the utilities and finance commission, then uh, that might be enough for the shores. Um, 
I'm just looking for an, an easier way to do this, number one, and number two, to allow it to be made public so that it's not just a conversation between two experts, so that everyone can understand. Well, I would, I would suggest putting that on the uh, Utilities Commission agenda, and we'll have them come in, in, in person and explain it all. Would that, would that work? I, I believe so. I mean, is, is that... the chef in the, in the future coming by to, to speak with the Utilities Commission or the Council? We don't have him plan at this time, but he's subject to our call at any time. Well, I know he comes by here quite a bit with, with some of the other clients. Oh, with other clients. Well, yeah, but if we schedule him for us, obviously we're paying for his time. Right. I'd suggest you wait and kind of see where, yeah, let's welcome the opportunity to, to let Indian River Shores, you know, review these numbers, see if, you know, yeah. And as we get closer or have some discussion, that yeah, we can bring there's that forward to utility. Some commission way to make it public. Yeah. That's that's my main concern. Yeah. If there's I a way to make it public, point, just... as opposed to a conversation, a private conversation between two individuals, and then Which the, the, the information you know never goes uh, any further. Well, um, I believe. I just appreciate that, I, and I think it's appropriate yeah. as well. Well, I, I would presume that Terry Deason would be making a presentation back to the Indian River Shores yeah. as mm -hmm. to his feelings of the calculations. Yeah. So I, I think okay. it would be coming. Do we I think, think it makes what makes sense to support the mayor's request is to let the experts talk. I mean, this is highly technical, and it's actually in my wheel of things I understand quite well. But uh, I think to do that in Tallahassee is the first step. Makes sense. If you want to go beyond that, Mr. Mayor, later on, and if 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 we want uh, Mr. Deason or Mr. Wright to co-author and uh, comments that that's fine with me but I, I would not I'm not for having people come down here and turn it into a carnival I think no, you need I don't the think experts, you necessarily you need the experts to, to talk I have no problem with that going back to the and, and perhaps something as simple as a transcript of their conversation might be helpful right. and, and, and could be made public and that way you can keep it uh, in an economical format okay anyway th thank you that's right is there any other public thank you. Uh, Comments before I call the question? We did get a well, second. Well, you don't, you don't have a motion. I'll make a motion to authorize the mayor to have our expert staff meet with Indian River Shores expert staff um, in their city of residence, which is Tallahassee. That's my motion. Can we amend that motion to include a transcript? Why don't you, yeah, go ahead and make the amendment and I'll second. Okay, so uh, uh, then I would make a motion that we approve the uh, meeting of the two professionals in Tallahassee so long as we can make it transparent by being provided with a transcript or something otherwise. Okay. Uh, we're we're uh, recording. Or, uh, well, yeah, uh, transcripts are expensive. Uh, Recordings are cheaper. Can, can I yes, sir? interject here? Why don't we just have a report from each of the professionals, if not a consolidated yes. report, individual reports, as opposed to having a, a, a court reporter there, there yeah. or something like yeah. that. That's that just adds cost, but if they both make a report back and we have, that becomes the public document. But this way we I get either consolidated that's... or individual from each yeah. side. I'll, I'll amend my motion that we're authorizing the mayor to authorize our experts to meet with any River Shores experts in the general area of their domicile, which is Tallahassee, to, to facilitate any River Shores understanding the valuation that we brought forth and that at the choice of the two sets of experts there either be two minutes or two reports back or a consolidated report their choice that's okay. my motion you would will you withdraw your previous motion yes i did okay you were in the midst of a motion are you okay with that i'm okay with that i, I want to make certain that it's transparent and i do i would like to go with whatever the cheapest way of doing that is Cheapest but effective. Most inexpensive, but effective, right? at least. Not cheap. <laughs> <laughs> None of it's cheap, right? No, cheap. Do I have a second? Do you deserve I'll a second. second it. Okay. Uh, all in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion passes. Um, going on to individual council's matters, um, I'm going to talk about um, how we run the meeting. Um, I've uh, I've actually been thinking about changing public comments so that it becomes closer to the end of the meeting um, so that we get through our business uh, sooner and then we go into uh, the public comment. Keep in mind the public still has the ability to comment on each one of our agenda items. Um, however, you know, as we go through the years, we're going to, uh, we're going to see a lot of uh, uh, 
well, changes in, in, in zoning, uh, land use ordinances, and it's going to require the, uh, the public to have their attorneys sitting out there. And one of the things that kind of irritates me is having a lot of people at the podium talk an awful long time and then seeing public in the audience uh, paying their attorneys to sit there and listen to it. I certainly don't have a problem uh, talking to the public in, uh, up here at the dais, but uh, if that's okay with the uh, with the council, I think we're going to let's just try it the next time around. See if we can't move public comment probably between nine and ten. If that's all right. Um, I think that's an excellent idea. I, I do I, too. I think that's an excellent idea, brother. Yes. Okay. With um, I'll go ahead and pass. Mr. Mayor, uh, yes. quick question. I may be stepping in the muddy waters here. I hope I'm not. But would it would it be more reasonable <laughs> because it's not unheard of? But would it be more reasonable to set a and I don't, a time limit on which people can speak. I don't think three minutes is enough time, but a reasonable amount of time. That way, people can, the public can still speak, and they have a reasonable amount of time to do so, but they do it prior to our business. Essentially leaving the structure the same, but putting a, a reasonable amount of time on how long somebody can, can speak. The, the problem with putting a time limit, there are certain people that will get combative with it okay. and, and actually use it to be combative with it. Okay. So I mean, you know, the whole. I'm not. I'm not going to name names, but you know, the idea is that if you move it after the meeting, the business is done. Uh, you know, I don't have a problem sitting here for an hour, you know, listening and, and interacting with people. But when the you know the public's paying for their attorneys to sit there, you know, 100 bucks an hour, right. that's a little right. different. Hi, um, Dan Lampson, Executive Director of the IRNA. I just wanted to chime in and say I think this is a, a good idea to try. I know Sebastian and the county both put it after their um, public hearings, and it uh, works out well for them usually. Uh, people will still come and talk. They're not going to scare anybody away if they're passionate about an issue, whatever it may be. And I think, you know, try it out and see what happens. It might make the meetings go a little better, and I think it might save some people some money. So. Yeah. Wonderful. Um, I'll, go, I'll go ahead and pass. Uh, Mr. Olms. Um, oh, I'm sorry. Can I speak, my apologies. Uh, can I speak on that subject, sure. uh, Mark Mutcher? I, I think this belongs under new business. Um, people had no way of knowing that this matter was going to be brought up. So under the um, concept of transparency, here we go again, um, it, it probably ought to be discussed under new business as a, or, or at least... Uh, to have uh, put it as a bullet point under your items. Okay. Mr. Uh, who Who sets, is it up to us to set the, the way these meetings are run, or how, how is that done? It's actually in the code, but it can always be amended. Um, that's one thing we had talked about, putting the order of proceedings in a resolution, so that it's somewhat easier to amend, but yeah. uh, an ordinance, it is codified in the code as the way the the, the uh, procedures are set up for each meeting. Yeah. So, Mr. Meester, you're suggesting that we warn everybody or have a discussion to point at before we do it, or what are you suggesting? Yes. Okay. Yeah, I would think I would agree. If anything, yeah, as far as moving public comment, it will require yeah a code change to to finalize that. If we're going to do it as a, a trial issue, I think you know it should be put on the agenda as you, a discussion. Uh, you could always you can always temper you know temporarily for a particular meeting. You can always amend your your proceedings yeah, for it. that meeting, but it wouldn't carry over unless you do make the ordinance change. Yeah. So maybe we ought to do it for one more meeting and saying the following meeting we're going to move it. Okay. Yeah. Um, I, uh, I've got one, one issue, um, and that is uh, my FMPA um, membership, my representation there. Um, I, I have done it now for a while, and I think it ought to be moved on to somebody else. I think somebody, the person who takes it on should be um, uh, someone who hasn't done it before. Um, and I think uh, it should either go to, to Harry or to, uh, to Jim. And I'm kind of open to suggestions. I think there's a good reason to to, to choose either one of them. And I'm um, I'm I'm going to re actually recommend that that um, that Harry do it, um, Mr. Howell do it. Um, and I'm just I think it's a good idea to learn about um, FMPA and what's behind it and how it works. Um, and um, uh, and I I would recommend that I pass it on to uh, to Mr. Howell. Mr. I, I, I would I would, I would concur. 
I would concur. Mm -hmm. Mr. Ola, perplexed that why you would recommend somebody who has not been involved with FAA, has no experience, uh, take this over when you said repeatedly how complicated FMPA is, how difficult a system to get to know. You go into a meeting and you don't know anybody and you can't speak with them outside because it's sunshine. You know, what an incredible process it is to get to understand it. I would think you'd certainly want somebody who had been there and had, had three years of experience and is willing to fill that position. Yeah, I, but, right. I, um, w but nothing happened uh, that was really positive when you were there, and so I, I think it's time to go have it go on to somebody else. Okay, and while, while Mr. Roll, while I, a positive yeah. effect. <laughs> while I, while, while I appreciate you uh, recommending me for this position, I too believe that uh, there is someone here who is much. You know, let me first state, we've been down this road. First we played musical chairs, and then we tried to figure out yeah, who, was right. going to be, who was going to be appointed to what board or committee. And so we've already made this decision, but it's also become clear, and I'll thank you for your honesty, that you, this is not something that you uh, would like to continue doing. And if that's the case, that's fine. However, if we're, going to, if we're going to find a replacement, it should be the most qualified person on this board, and I believe that person to be Pilar Turner. I believe the most qualified person, if you are not concerned with the elected representative thing, is uh, Jim O'Connor. He's clearly more qualified than anyone sitting up here. And most cities do it that way. So I would nominate him, Mr. Hetty. But Mr. Hetty, uh, Mr. I mean, Mr. Howe, I wrote down Mr. Hetty so here. Offensive. You know, you, you had a 28-minute dialogue earlier with Mr. Hetty, and it was largely about FMPA. You know, the, the reality is, for the last four years or four and a half years I've been here, whether it was Mrs. Turner or, or Mr. Old, Mr. Old got one small change, nobody has had any success with FMPA. I think it's time to to uh, try new blood. I, I think to go back to the well again when they achieved nothing is a bad idea. So Well, maybe nothing being achieved with the FNPA is how the FNPA, FNPA would like it to remain. Uh, I, and I object to that. I think we have seen some response in FNPA. There's certainly a much more discussion. When I first went to FNPA, an item would come on the board and no would be no discussion from the board members at all. Once we started listening to recordings and checking their records, people say, oh, you know what, I did vote for that. Or, you know, who voted for this? There's actually discussion going on. There are questions being made. You know, why have we had the same auditor firm for 10 years? A lot of things, I think, have made, had some positive effect. That's right. I, I would like a motion that, um, um, that the, the um, representation changed from me to, uh, to Mr. O'Connor. I'll second it. Once again, I object that we've been fighting to have our utility be represented by an elected accountable official and that this is one of the real drawbacks of the Florida Municipal Power Association, that they're setting rates and not do not have an elected accountable representative there. That's right. There's something strategic going on here, and I can't put my finger on it, but it certainly strikes me as odd. And I think that if you're going to make a change, it needs to be Pilar Turner. She's the most qualified on this board, and I would recommend that she be our liaison to the FNPA. Well, certainly it is strategic, and it's his politics. I mean, that's kind of the nature of the business. I, I, no, I mean, in all honesty. It, it, it I is. should say underhanded then, perhaps. Well, it's all politics is underhanded. Mr. Moocher? And you're Mark Mutcher again, a couple things. Um, it seems to me and to a lot of people I know that having utility directors and city managers making up the vast majority of the FMPA board is um, a part, if not all, of the problem up there. Mm -hmm. And um, at, at one point, the decision was made to try and not only have our representative be an elected official, but also to proselytize that and try and get the other cities to uh, make the uh, representatives uh, elected officials. And as a matter of fact, that's all part of Debbie Mayfield's bill, as you recall. The other thing is, procedurally, I know we've been kind of loose, but I guess I'll ask the city attorney, can can things be voted on that are brought up under members' matters? 
Yeah, it's it's kind of the privilege of the council that you can make a motion just about any time. Oh, is that right? There's no restrictions as they can't. Okay. Well, I again I, I question the propriety of doing that because it's not an agenda item and nobody knows that this is going to be voted on unless you happen to be sitting here until the very very end. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Ms. Moss. Thank you. Uh, Laura Moss, Utilities Commission member at large. I think we should keep in mind, and I can certainly appreciate Mr. Old's uh, wish to uh, leave the position. I think he's expressed it on uh, numerous occasions in different ways. Uh, but let's keep in mind, we're not just changing a person. You're changing an entire category. You're going from an elected official to um, city manager. That's. I think that that's that uh, as competent as Mr. O'Connor might be. I think that that's highly inappropriate. Um, and I think perhaps uh, I have a, I have a suggestion. I think this might be an interesting thing. Uh, you mentioned earlier in this session that you will have a workshop coming up. Um, I think that this might be an ideal topic for that workshop, and that way people you know, can attend it, you can discuss it amongst yourselves, um, whom the person should be. But I, I really think that it's very critical to um, keep the status of that person, that that person be an elected uh, representative. That's, it, it, there's an, an immense issue of accountability. I mean, when you look at the, the funds that uh, FMPA um, lost, um, it's just, just it's just immense that that issue. So I would I would request that you leave it for for a workshop where you could discuss it amongst yourselves. This seems to have come up rather suddenly, so I I would request that. I think well, it's very important, and not as as I said earlier, not just a matter of the person, but the category. You're changing categories. That's a huge change. Thank you. Keep in member all you know. Keep in mind all the meetings are open and the workshops are open. Um, so if you want a, any of the information, they are subject to public information requests. Uh, everything is transparent. If you have a problem with some of the transparency, I'm sure they would uh, love to talk to you about it and, and explain that. I know they've met with people in the past, and uh, unfortunately they couldn't show proprietary information, but I don't think they've ever withheld any, held any information unless it was proprietary. Yeah, I, I think Jim is, is uh, s sort of has two hats. He's accountable. Um, and he's also experienced, and so I think those two sides uh, make him um, a, a good a good party to this, or a good um, appointment to this also. So I don't I don't think that it's it's a huge jump between my my uh, being there as a position and and his being there as a position. So okay, I'm going to call the question. Is there any other further comments? Uh, all in favor of making Mr. Uh, O'Connor the uh, the appointee, say aye. 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 Opposed? Opposed. Opposed. Motion passes three to two. Uh, Mr. Old, you still have your matters. Uh, I've got, there is one issue on FMPA that I'm going to go up for um, coming up, and that is a, um, uh, they're going through the search process for a general manager, um, and I've been involved in that somewhat in terms of I have a strong opinion about it. And so there's a on the 14th there's a um, a meeting of the of the selection committee, and so I'm going to go up for that. Um, uh, and, and maybe Jim, if you want to go, we can go together. But this is a this is selection selecting a committee a committee to do it and what they're going to look for. And I think it's a very important thing. So I'm going to stay in it for that. So, okay, Ms. Turner. Yes, I attended the uh, Metropolitan Planning Organization meeting and approved the final Indian River County 2040 long range plan, if you can believe it. That's our planning horizon um, for our road system. Still have a little bit of controversy um, coming up on 43rd Avenue, um, expanding that in the long term area, but we're going to be looking at some other options on that. Uh, there was a little discussion on all aboard Florida that we should have received our 90% plans. Um, we, they used to say we, we as in not only Vero Beach, but the Olive Indian River County have not received those to date. And the Department of Transportation still hasn't issued a final decision on the environmental plan. So we continue to be, you know, causing some lags in um, Brightline or all aboard, whatever. And I think that's those are positive steps. Um, 
Wanted to thank everybody at the Heritage Center, the city of Vero Beach that made this New Year's celebration possible. I mean, how they could put this together in 30 days. Um, I know even Elite Airways got in it, that we had a lot a lot involved. I think it was a, a great success, and I look forward to having many more New Year's in downtown Vero Beach. And I wish you all a very happy New Year. Mr. Winger? Uh, the only thing I have to report is that uh, Mrs. Bach and I will attend the Treasure Coast Council of Local Governments. Ms. Mrs. Bach has the pleasure of being the recording secretary. And I, I am the, for the reason that I'm chair, it's a one year rotation and it is held in, uh, at the Indian, uh, I, I, I'm sorry, the St. Lucie County Complex. That's all I have to report, Mr. Mayor. Mr. Howell? Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, I, Attended the New Year celebration downtown Vero on New Year's Eve, and I want to thank everybody who worked so hard to put that together. Uh, I had, a, <clears throat> pardon me, I did not stay until midnight, uh, but I had a wonderful time, and I want to thank them for that. And I have another matter that I, um, I I want to bring up, and I don't have an answer to this, and I'm not sure that anyone does at the moment without some serious changes uh, by the state. But I've been, of course, keep keeping up with the news, and. Um, very disheartened by the amount of um, people that have been injured walking and riding bicycles on our streets, uh, not necessarily just in the city, but certainly in the county in, in the last few weeks. And um, it's, it's a big problem that we have, and I think awareness uh, is a first step, but uh, in trying to, in trying to uh, keep these things from happening again. But uh, I just wanted to make a general statement so that Maybe I can add some more awareness just by sitting here. I don't know, but uh, certainly things need to change and, and safety needs to be a concern. Completely agree. That's all. Thank you. Okay. Yeah. Thanks. All right. With that, unless there's any other comments from anybody, we are adjourned. Thank you. Thank you.